Hello, everybody. Welcome to SEAL Team 7. I'm very honored to introduce my next guest, who I've spoken to many, many times, but this is the only time he's actually been on my show. We've been together. We've met IRL. He's very handsome in person, too. Just, you know, this isn't just filters and a great camera. This is... He's a lot just of a, filters. He's a handsome dude. Uh, so... Prof Noctis, or Professor Noctis, go ahead and introduce yourself briefly. Just tell us quickly what you do. Hey, hey. Uh, it's really good to be here. I feel like um, I, I feel like we've done this before, but it's never been on your show, <laughs> um, and I absolutely love it. But I'm um, glad to be here. Uh, I'm Professor Noctis, aka Wade, uh, in, in real life, I guess. Um, I am faculty at the University of Alabama, where I teach a number of things, particularly religion, some literature, some um, kind of cursory philosophy stuff, all through video games. Uh, that's what I did my dissertation on, the usage of video games in education to teach things that are not about video games, right? And so my dissertation focused on Final Fantasy XV as a method of teaching sacral kingship narratives from the ancient Near East, um, leading into mess, um, messianic. Messianic understandings, theology, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, that's what I do. I, I am a content creator on Twitch and on YouTube as well uh, as an outflow of all of that stuff at the university. And uh, here I am. So, yeah. Also a big wrestling fan. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm, I'm ready to say, like, I'm a big wrestling fan, but I follow it <laughs> every time it's on. Fair enough. So I go to live shows. I make signs. No big deal. Um, and I've, I've listened to a lot of your, uh, content, um, including your lecture series and they, they really are, they, they connect the source material to something educational in a really, uh, fascinating and, uh, almost dialectic way. And mm -hmm. I strongly recommend that to everybody if, if you want to learn about those topics. Um, and you know, if you happen to not necessarily like the games, it's a good way to gain uh it's a good way to consume them uh in a more palatable way uh, there's one game that you cover that um i enjoy your your lecture series more than the game and that's you know so it's a like let's say you have to know about the game in order to you know have street cred you know you learn about the game too um what was it 15 was I'm, that the one? I would never say that. Uh, you I'll would say never it say after. It? Yeah, I'll say that after. Uh, 15 <laughs> is, you know, I will say that you... Um, 15 was a... 15 is more beloved than the internet would have you think, but it is... Mm -hmm. uh, but the internet does have a kind of a, a bone to pick with 15. And yeah, um, nice. there's a... I know you know a lot of the context behind that involves the the origin of the project yeah. and how it switched hand and changed identity and uh, a lot of people like the initial vision more I wish we had got that and we kind of might mm -hmm. maybe sort of are with with kingdom hearts somehow which yeah a lot of thoughts on that etc but uh you know for the most part i still look upon 15 pretty fondly like more mm -hmm. now than i did say maybe two or three years ago uh I, yeah, I, I would say that I, you know, maybe it's hitting that ten year mark soon, and so I've given myself permission to ease up on it. Yeah. Uh, but that said, um, you know, I, I really think that your series and your the materials that you bring up, um, you know, allowed me to see that in a in a way that I never even really considered. I, I certainly recognize symbolism in all the Final Fantasy games. There's always going to be connections to um you know mythology religion philosophy that stuff is just jrp fodder and we we talk about that pretty regularly uh whenever you have a discussion on any jrpg but final fantasy definitely uh leans in pretty heavy uh and mm. pretty much every square published rpg does the um you know the with with 15 forever i you know i i almost had thought that maybe it leaned away from it a little bit and uh and you kind of actually uh changed my mind on that and and just mm. uh helped me recognize that it focused on things that i really that, that final fantasy didn't necessarily focus on before um yeah. and i don't know if that's uh after tabata got involved or before but i'm going to kind of assume after 
but yeah. either way um very interesting stuff um so you just beat rebirth you're you're i, I don't want to say you're late to the party I it's am. a long very game late. uh in, in terms of content creators you're yeah. you're probably a little late but it's a long game and you know i expect a lot of people uh you know out in the world the standard consumer you know are taking their time with this game and i think that's probably the best way i wish i could have done that um so your thoughts overall on rebirth i've been watching your journey a little bit and oh spoiler alert they're positive you had a pretty positive outlook right. overall but why don't you tell me like um your general thoughts on the game as a whole and then we will get into specific topics like the ending and um, yeah you know stuff like that man i like so my first playthrough it ended at 175 hours um i i did tried to do absolutely everything i could i did not want to leave this world um at all i still don't i'm i'm in this like post ending depression right now um for me from the first moment i turned it on i i felt like the game was special and then in the grasslands it really hit it, it was good but it really was toward the end of junon and in costa del sol that i was like I, this could be pretty close up there for maybe one of my favorite games of all time um and the more that I played, the more that I explore, explored, the more NPCs that I encountered, the more mini games I did, I was like, this is, this is a different level of game for me. And um, I, I, I don't know what else to say beyond I cherished everything in this game. <laughs> Like literally everything. Like I, I made a dumb meme about it the other day. Like what what is it that you you hate about Rebirth? Uh, and I was like, there's not a thing I don't cherish about uh, this game. Yes. Like yes. the the box throwing, like everything that was like a weird pace change. <laughs> I was like, I'm here for it. Like I I just loved it. Um, the characters. There was not a moment that I was like, I wish this wasn't in this game. And that's that's a weird claim to say, but it's also the reason why I'm a terrible critic. Like, I just loved <laughs> this game, you know? I loved it. Um, you do love things. I, I, I do kind of know I that about things. you. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, you have a generally optimistic point of view on yeah. uh, on most games. And um, and so that's fine. Um, yeah. I have my I have my gripes with with Rebirth. Uh, I still think it's. Uh, the best game I've played this decade, and I've played some really good games this decade. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've played, you know, it's it's up there with like Alan Wake 2 and mm. The Last of Us 2, which um, mm -hmm. don't come at me, internet, for saying that I like The Last of Us 2. Uh, and, uh, you know, some really just solid video games. Uh, yeah, and that includes the plot for me. I, I was really, I was really positive overall on the plot. There were some things where it's like, uh, you see the vision, you see how good everything else is, you see the potential of things, and I, I did feel like some things like didn't hit their potential. There mm. were some mini games and stuff like that too that I think um, maybe came out of the game a little broken but got fixed. Um, but th mm. those were so few and far between that it, it's just like. Uh, you know, 0.1% of this game that I feel like I'm not having fun. The rest of the time, it was like you couldn't, you couldn't pull the smile off my face. And yeah. um, so it's hard for me to rate a game like that uh, negatively. Yeah. Like I just, I feel like I'm doing a disservice to say, hey, you shouldn't get this game. Um, yeah. I think you should get this game. I think everybody should get this game. Uh, so the, you know, part of the reason that I wanted to make content in the first place is that uh, about final fantasy 7 is that i i have a an expertise in um in jewish mysticism uh hebrew studies and um uh, you know obviously all the all the surrounding philosophy uh that comes that comes with you know just your standard uh master's level education uh in in anything anything even remotely in that topic you're going to learn about this stuff you're going to learn about a lot of symbolism that uh that gets brought up constantly a lot of buzzwords you hear in all of all of 
all of these games. In Final Fantasy VII, um, you know, the the villain is is named Sephiroth, and uh, there's a, the the portmanteau of Genova being you know Nova and Jehovah and Jehovah. New God. It, 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 there's all this stuff that's Genesis is is mentioned. Anything on that side of the fence is given yeah. this very religious symbolism, uh, and so. I wanted to make content that that focused on some of that stuff in the OG, and I know you uh, certainly have made a lot of connections to the Kabbalah and, um, you know, you, the the possibility that Tifa and Aerith are are named after Tiferet, which is you know the um, one of the core Sephirot, or mm -hmm. core Sephir, um, and I I know that like going into Rebirth. I had a real eye, like, hey, are we going to lean more into that? Are we going to lean into mythology? They certainly leaned into to Norse mythology, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I was surprised they they did make some, um, you know, really interesting little connections to the source material of um, of the Kabbalah of Jewish mysticism of all the Abrahamic connections. What were some of the ones that one of some of the references that stood out to you that we were like, oh, that's for me? Did you have yeah, any like that? So, for me, I felt like remake actually did it maybe a little bit more, and that's but that that maybe four years of marination before I made my first video on that stuff. Okay. Um, so you know, with it still being fresh, um, right off the the top of the head here with with kabbalah and jewish mysticism and things like that i don't know how strong those linkings are immediately i found a lot more in line with buddhism than than i did um with um judaism or judeo-christian um interpretations now they were certainly there um but i think that it has more to do with say um and I, I don't remember if I mentioned this in one of my videos. It was it was in an early script of one of them. But the idea of the the Jewish mystic devocat, which is the kind of idea of like um, devotion, which is going to impart some sort of special sacred knowledge. Um, there's a lot with Aerith, especially in the Temple of the Ancients, and this is one of the things that I was most excited about. The idea that Aerith, who has, has lost her connection to the planet's memories and, and foreknowledge at the end of Remake, and she says this at the beginning of Rebirth, it's this idea of the unknown, and then she's able to rekindle that through prayer and through ritual in the Temple of the Ancients. And that, to me, was an incredibly powerful um, moment of, quote, devocate, where she's she's um, tapping into the knowledge of that um, Sephiro Tree of Life uh, Kabbalah sort of stuff, which I, I thought was just like really, really great. Um, but again, right now I'm really thinking more in terms of Buddhism <laughs> than I am necessarily Judaism. <laughs> um, you know, to be honest, I, I feel the same way. I mean, there's some elements yeah. of Gnosticism that, that hmm. uh, Gnostic enlightenment that, um, yeah. uh, that feels adjacent to what the, the Setra and, and, uh, you know the idea of knowledge, fonts of knowledge, the the way that Gnosticism deals with, um, mm. you know, uh, sort of killing God <laughs> as right. a, uh, you know, the demiurge sort of uh, sort of connections are all there. But um, I I do think that Aerith in particular and the Cetra seem to they all seem to um, they have this way of. Of affiliation to almost explicitly non-Abrahamic connections, and I've always, yeah. I've always thought that that was potentially messaging about uh, colonialism and uh, and you know particularly Abrahamic colonization and how it um, yeah. you know adapts uh, other other. Uh, previous mythologies and uh you know icons and idols and uh and will sometimes that will make its way into into its its general sort of makeup like uh you know the the way that the the jinn uh and mm -hmm. the depictions of the jinn have really 
um, influence demonology, for instance. I always thought that the separation between, you know, the old society and this new um, spiritual threat, so to speak, being affiliated mm -hmm. with uh, Abrahamic religion was was potentially commentary on that. I've relented on that a little bit, and I think it's it's less concrete. And I do know that, for instance, the newest iteration of the lore includes the this idea that the Republic of Junon, which is, you know, this former Republican government, was in fact monotheistic. Like they had a they had a god and they did yeah. and God was creation. And that Shinra actually kind of came and toppled some of that concept with um mm -hmm. you know with something uh like atheist by design. And I I think that's really some of the things that makes the the world system really feel organic and fresh is that uh you know even though it's a microcosm of our society all of these factions uh you know have this uh neutrality to them and then they also have these assignments and it does sort of reflect our own belief but where where eastern philosophy like fits in has always been kind of hard because you have this uh you have this clearly eastern society you know with right. wutai and a little bit with rador but um you know, they seem to have like more of a Taoist look, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a Taoist kind of perspective. And so to see uh, each of these factions kind of just uh, be neutral in their own way, it, it, it was kind of refreshing because it felt like, oh, it's not as simple as religion bad or, you know, uh, Jesus bad, etc. It's, right. it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, and well, and I, I think it goes back to something that you said maybe before the, the stream started. Um, you know, each of these societies in the game, they are they're dabbling in meaning making, right? Yeah. And it, it is this idea of, you know, how does the grasslands make sense of its own existence? And so you get this amazing lore and myth of, of Titan mm -hmm. and creation and, and emerging out of the water. And that's why it's so fertile and all this stuff. And, and that's the way that they think of it. And then with Junon, you get this, um, the Phoenix, right? And, and you get the, the Phoenix and Junon, which is these flames of rebirth. Um, and they are, they're, they're, there's a strong tone of resistance and you've got two representations you've got under junon who's kind of very active um protesting um looking to, to ronda for leadership to how are we going to stick it to shinra and then you've got the escapist or isolationist mentality of um of those that have left under junon to create their own society and so both are, are forms of resistance, but both are forms of um, kind of the flames of resistance into a rebirth uh, for Junon, which I think is really interesting. That's the thing that I took from the Junon region. These are two communities that are trying to be reborn out of resistance in different ways. And so the Phoenix is, is kind of like their, their mascot yeah. in that respect. Yeah. Again, making meaning of those things. I think you can do that with each one of the... The villages and towns in the game yeah also there's a giant bird there and it just worked also the giant bird so yeah. that worked really well yeah so. yeah that, that's always <laughs> so sometimes a cigar is a cigar you know what i'm saying sometimes it is yeah sometimes it is but um i i there's so many moments in the game that feel like the lore is really precise and um yeah. that it's uh and i think i think one because it's old as a as an ip and so Nojima's had a lot of time to cook up a bunch of connections mm. and collaborate with people. And so it does oh, feel man. like there's a lot of subtext to everything that's happening um, because they've had time to make it. Uh, but also, uh, I think the the benefit of making a really deep lore environment and world in a trilogy is that one of the you know one of the benefits some people don't think this is a benefit but i do of a three-part series of this kind of three-part series is that mm. gives us stuff to speculate on um yeah. it helps with theory crafting and theory crafting is a thing that you know uh primarily yeah. i do here and uh we're gonna do on this chat and uh it's it's not for everybody but i really i really think that it's helped 
make this three-part game uh, more interesting to, uh, you know, stay attached to. And so I, I, I think that that's another benefit to this level of like deep lore and mm -hmm. making connections. So I do think that, you know, Phoenix being representative of a, like of a, you know, defiant reborn society uh, mm -hmm. and that being the Republic of Junon is, is, is maybe intentional. Yeah. Um, so real quick, what, what was your, Let's give like a, a list of top three moments. Oh my in, gosh. Uh, <laughs> in 175 hours. Yeah. Um, my top three moments. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to include the ending in this because that's, that's going to be something else, I think. Um, but for me, chapter nine, Gungaga, uh, may be my favorite part of the whole game. Um, I've taken some heat on Twitter. Well, I take a lot of heat on Twitter, but I took some heat when I was like, I love Gungaga. And then I got the story of Gungaga and I was like, oh, this chapter is my favorite in the game. Um, to me, that one, it was just, it was momentous, uh, powerful um, sort of stuff. It was new, but it worked in an incredibly great way for me that expanded Tifa, it expanded, um, cloud um his first break oh my god or first major break i that yeah there's something really dangerous going on with cloud here i felt um i i to me that was number one before um, you go to number two i'm just gonna tell I, you that that is a like sub zero take that is easily the most beloved chapter in the it? game world yeah um chat i think i think most people okay. would say chapter nine serious? best oh easy Easy. Who's attacked me on Twitter? There's like well, words of the. <laughs> I think I think some people argued that the um, the way the actual level is laid out uh, is yeah, the sure. is the hardest to navigate. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So they just so like I, the region, take, but love yeah. the chapter. And my my take was a little bit more on. I, I really love the exploration of Gengaga. It's so different. It's a change of pace, and that may be a little bit more cold uh, of a take, but. Uh, or hot or warm, sorry yeah. it's a little bit warmer <laughs> but um i yeah. i actually agree i um the the only thing hmm. about gungaga that gra was a little ground on me was the music the one of the things that happens in the music too is that with each um as you unlock the intel tower and unlock intel towers the the music expands and gets gets interest more interesting yeah. somehow like with gungaga like it got more it started to lean into the things that I didn't like about the the song. Oh, really? More. So it just got worse and worse. <laughs> Not bad. Um, oh no! <laughs> but every everything else, every other you know region's music was just fantastic. So, yeah, and it, you know yeah. it's probably good. They did they did get kind of uh, they did borrow vocals from this bizarre French uh, song without crediting it. But I think oh really yeah. Weird. But nobody's sued him for it yet, so it's probably fine. Okay. Well. Yeah. Uh, so number two. What's number two for you? Um, n number two for me, um, I I loved Costa del Sol. Um, the mini game sort of stuff there, it worked for me. And the way that um, you kind of split up the party where you've got Cloud running off and doing some things, and then you've got Tifa and Aerith doing some things with Red. I, I just, I loved all of that because and, and the reason that i liked it wasn't necessarily because of the change of pace but because um it shows off the characters in some new lights uh you've got some new relationships really cementing the friendship of tifa and Aerith, and then also even beyond that um you are you're giving all of the characters um a little bit more room to breathe um you know that stuff is coming like, especially if you've played the original, you know that danger is on its way. And you know that things are brewing. It is... Costa del Sol, to me, was the closest thing to, like, those first eight chapters in Final Fantasy XV, where you're just, like, freewheeling and dealing with your friends, um, knowing that it's eventually going to end. And so I just knew, I was like, I'm savoring this. 
Um, but if I had to put an exact moment that I was like, okay, this is next level, it's the sunset scene at Costa del Sol after the Hojo fight. Oh, yeah, that was a great that scene. Quiet that quiet moment. Yeah. That quiet moment after the fight, after all the mini games, not too many games can pull off a, oh, this is just a set piece where you don't really do anything, you just experience it. Mm -hmm. and I, that, was, that was some amazing storytelling. Um, that I was in, engrossed and I didn't want to leave. I probably spent 30 minutes there and like I, I've got like <laughs> I've got so many photos of me trying to make it look like Cloud was surfing because I would just do a roll right next to the surfboards and like he'd just do this thing. I was like I, if I angle it just right that was me just playing in the sea <laughs> for like 30 minutes <laughs> at sunset. It was just to me that's what that moment in the game really was it's a breather a calm before the coming storm and i loved that so okay so you're saying that that is number three as like a subsect no that was number two that's okay a... <laughs> so it was number three okay goes to del sol and the, the my third favorite moment um god it's so hard to choose um, just one, but I would probably go with, oh man, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I want to say calm. I'm not going to say calm. I'm going to say Nebel, Mount Nebel, when you get the added Zach context, when you return to Nibelheim um, in chapter 11, I think. Yeah, that's chapter 11. Okay. That, ad that addition to me and Cloud kind of having this like, again, break where he's like, oh, Zach died. He fell, he fell into the river and he was washed away. And then he tells Tifa that and Tifa's like, let's keep that between us. I'll talk to Aerith about that. And I was like, Oh, the drama and the tension. I just, yeah. I loved it. Gosh, I like that and that, too. That's, yeah. That was something that I just, I, I was like, I was wondering how they were going to keep this kind of like um, wonky narrative in Cloud's mind going, you know? And the way that they fleshed it out, and I, I love the way that they're introducing Zach little bit by little bit into Cloud's memory throughout this game. It, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. To me, it remedies something that I found um, to be a flaw in the original game. Um, I didn't feel like the breadcrumbs were there enough for Zach in the original mm. game, and this one's doing it. Interesting. Yeah, that's probably my biggest critique of the original game, to be honest. Um, okay, well, I will say that that is a considerably hotter... Anything from chapter 11 is a, is a hot really? take. A lot of people did not like that chapter. I had uh, some like issues. It's box throwing, so. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I have some issues with it too. Um, I I get why they did it, it um, but it it, it it certainly lost a lot of the haunting, weird feel. But it's almost impossible yeah. to do that now, just because, uh, you know, the the pacing of of the exposition is so different that it's really hard to just like get away with, um. You're going to this place where everybody pretends not to know you or not know what happened. Right. Um, that's tough, right? And so uh, I can see why people maybe had uh, took issue with that. But that said, I think that um, mm. the the moments you're talking about were really interesting. Um, uh, for me personally, I think you know chapter nine is it's a it's a top one for me. Uh, another one is the trials. I think the trials in chapter thirteen. Uh, we're yeah. just we're just really uh really top notch uh, i include that in my like that's the ending and it's a whole other world yeah for me okay um, fair i enough, can't yeah. even include it. yeah fair enough uh oh, the the, the, the black man. materia explanation that whole segment too i i really enjoyed that um yeah okay so let's get into the meat of it now so uh real quick what is in your interpretation what's going on with the whispers there's white ones, there's black ones. What happened? So, um, I'm still processing that. Now, you you understand that, like, I mean, you and I have talked about this a couple of times on, on in various formats, but um, my understanding of the whispers is that it's a mechanism to talk about the 
um, the foreknowledge, the will, the governance of the planet. And Red kind of speaks to that in Remake in chapter, what is it, 16? I think um, in in Aerith's home base in the in the Hodo's lab in Shinra Tower, and so that's where that kind of comes from. And so to see the whispers return, uh, first of all, I, I was excited to see the whispers back, I, just yeah. because I think that it is such a cool mechanism for the will of the planet. Um, and for the subversion of that will of the planet. So what's going on with the whispers? Well, now we have two camps of whispers. We have those that are um, kind of co-opted by um, outside malevolent forces. And then we have those that are defenders of the planet still. Um, I, when, when I think of the whispers, I, and again, like th this is something that I've, I've said a few times in a few formats. When I think of the whispers, I'm thinking in terms of what are the what are the concepts regarding predestination? This is actually something the developers talked about, this understanding of predestination. Um, and so predestination exists in a lot of um, mythos and, and religions and all that kind of stuff. But for me, um, Calvinism does a pretty strong, um, it gives a, a good old college try in trying to formulate a systematic way of understanding divine knowledge. And it says in, in the Institutes of Religion from John Calvin, it ta uh, talks about the foreknowledge of God, the providence of God, which is kind of the direction and the will of God, um, not just the knowledge of all possibilities, but the preference of those possibilities, which ultimately leads to a third subset in predestination, which is the governance of those possibilities. So you have to have all three of these. The divine has, number one, um, knowledge of every outcome, Number two, a preference in those outcomes. Three, the ability to manipulate those outcomes. So that's breaking it down as, as much as possible. The governance aspect is the whispers. So the question is, if you can take away or in some ways fracture or even neuter the governance of the planet by co-opting, stifling, shattering the power of the whispers, can you then impose a separate providence into this foreknowledge of possibility? And I think that's what we're seeing Sephiroth doing. And I think that it's even more elaborated here in Rebirth, um, especially toward the end, because you have the full foreknowledge of all things, like every outcome, every possibility possible. There's a, there's a reality. Um, are you with me? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. One of the ways that I describe this, um, whether it's in my classroom or on my stream, when, I, when I'm talking about the will of the divine in religious contexts, um, regardless of the providence, regardless of governance of that sort of thing, when we talk about foreknowledge, we're a sports school at the University of Alabama, <laughs> um, so I, I use these analogies. Um, think March Madness brackets, okay? Have you ever done a March Madness bracket? Like the whole, like, choose your 64 yeah. teams and then choose which one's going to win. This is the way that I think about um, the foreknowledge of existence. Every option, every, every agent, all intersecting and moving throughout, throughout history. And so my choice today of, you know, what am I going to eat may lead to, you know, a conversation I have at one restaurant versus sitting at home or something like that. And this basketball bracket goes all the way on and out. Now, sometimes decisions are made for me. I'm shifted off of my axis into a decision I didn't really make, but I'm shifted. If we are to pull out, divine foreknowledge says that the divine or the planet in this case sees every potential outcome. Now, if you pull out even more, you see every potential outcome of every single person, of every single bit of creation from earthquakes to meteors to whatever else. And then it's this question of, so what is the, the divine will of, of time and eternity? And this is what we would term destiny or fate. What rebirth does so interestingly is it makes real the very notion of every possibility so that every branching path in that basketball bracket is a reality in and of itself. 
And there seems to be an awareness since the governance and the providence of the planet is stifled, mm. if that makes sense. And I think to me, that's what's really, really cool here. So what you get is you get a, not just a planet with a foreknowledge, but you get a Sephiroth with a foreknowledge of every possible outcome and an Aerith who knows of every possible scenario and sees the mm. similarities and then also the distinctions. And they're able to operate in a way outside of all of this. And the only way you're able to do this is if you understand that the life stream itself is made up of memories, past, present, and future. It's the memories of the planet and a memory of things that haven't even happened yet, right? You take away that one guiding, like governing force, and suddenly everything is open. Mm. And I, that to me is what makes Sephiroth incredibly malevolent here because there's this existence of all possibility. And what does he say at the end? I, I mean, I, again, I've only played it once now and I, I've watched my own replay once uh, uh, since then just to kind of prepare for this. They're ta he's talking about creating eternity and forever, you know? And so what is eternity and forever ex uh, other than infinite possibility and in, in this kind of like beyond timeness where there is no beginning and end point it's just all encompassing new worlds always being created now mm. I, I can speak more to all of that but to me that's what the whispers are representing and the quote um i guess the the white whispers are trying to restore that governance of the planet's will and these darker whispers are trying to subvert that is what it appears to me. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I I have no notes. I I think I think that's a it's a functional way to relabel and make meaning out of the white whispers and stuff. Okay. So then, uh, what what are your thoughts on the entire interlude section? Right. So we uh, the interlude is is of course the the segment Zach? that that Zach plays in. Um, in inner, are, are you talking about in intermission, or are you no. talking about in this game? In this game, the game is the the anytime uh, you are in, you're looking at the Zach scenes. It's called the interlude. It. So there's okay. um, it's a it's got its own outline in the in the yeah. outline section. Um, so I guess what's going on with Zach? And what's going on with Stan? Yeah. So my in interpretation of that and again it's it's just a lens and interpretation um <sighs> realities are created at the mere desire and intention of those realities okay and so anytime you have uh like going back to that basketball bracket sort of thing anytime you've got a bracket set up between two choices which are viable cho choices like there's a, an actual desire. And I think that this is spoken to when, when Zach um, literally is in the subway and it, it, there's like, I can go right and save cloud or I can go left and I can go stop bigs from this, um, you know, bombing and sort of thing. And, you know, he's, he's almost got this like bracelet around his arm. That's like, what would Aerith do? And then goes on to the right, and immediately you get this flood of light on the left-hand side. Well, that, to me, it can mean a couple of things. Number one, it could be a, a, a Aerith consciousness kind of happening, or it's this creation of um, a whole new opportunity and option that was not taken. It's the, the road not traveled, you know? Gotcha. And yet, that road not traveled becomes a road that is traveled um, in, in another reality. Um, and I don't, I don't even know if reality, timeline, there, there's a poverty of words at play that I don't think poverty allows for the words. sufficiency. That's fantastic. Um, Yes. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I, I think I think that I do it a disservice if I simply call it a timeline. Sure. Um, I think the word that they use is worlds, and I think that that's a little bit more helpful. But to, to the reality, I think is a little bit more. Um, it's less Marvel Endgame, and I think sure. that that's the the fault of saying that this is about timelines. This is multiverse sort of thing. I don't think that multiverse. It really encompasses it. Instead, it is um, an infinity 
um, of options that have manifested as reality. And so if these are memories of the planet and there's no governance to say which one is the real memory, then they're all reality and none of them are fiction. But to the planet, there is a will. There is a providence that says this is fact and these others are, are fiction here. But right now it's unrestrained. So when it comes to stamp, um, my headcanon, now again, this is just headcanon, okay. from Remake. Um, I believe that somewhere it was said that stamp was drawn by Palmer. Palmer, is that correct? Yeah. So it was okay. uh, when when the budget was cut for the space yeah. program. And he started doodling. Yeah. Yeah. And so my thought on this was that is a that's a moment of desire on Palmer's part, right? Where he can he can draw a beagle, but what if it was a terrier? And what if it was apparently a chihuahua um, and, and other options, you know? Sure. And so each one of these represents a different option of, of that. So you have like, I, I mean, you're a content creator. How many things end up on the cutting room floor, right? The edits that, and imagine if those edits that you left out spun off and created an entirely different channel for yourself. That's what's kind of at play here. Mm -hmm. um, if I had kept that thing in, who would have followed me? Who would have unfollowed me? And where would I be then? Maybe Genova, maybe Sephiroth, maybe something else I don't even know is creating all of these things in, in, um, in reality, I, I guess. Um, so that's the kind of the way that I'm I'm thinking of of these stamps. Um, now, is that going to be explained in part three? I don't think it's necessarily important to explain that. Well, these were all of the discarded Palmer stamp <laughs> bags or what. I I don't I don't think Fair. you're going to get a lot. Instead, it's a great device for letting us know, hey, this isn't the same option that was taking place prior. Um, so, for instance, you've got um, you know Beagle stamp, uh -huh. and then. This first option is the desire of Zach to live, perhaps, you know, um, and that emerges as terrier stamp. Well, then you, on the wall in the graffiti behind Zach, as he's thinking, shall I go to the tower or shall I go to sector six? There's the terrier. Right. Then that light happens when he goes to see Biggs, which he doesn't in that he goes to the tower. Right. Um, you see um, you see this other stamp that's on the chip bag that Biggs is doing. So what this is letting us know is that these are three separate in, um, instances. Um, and maybe instance is the, I don't know, still poverty words, but um, it's it's one of those, it, it's just a nice visual signifier that we're in a different place. So mm -hmm. I don't think too much about the the stamps other than that. Also, is 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 it logical to say that Johnny carrying around that other stamp is a fourth one. Yeah, it is. So um, is it okay? So yeah. again, I have not looked and listened no, to anything because I wanted to come into this. That's why I wanted. That's why I wanted you here. Um, <laughs> is just just a raw, unfiltered take. But yeah. So mm -hmm. the the clarifying answer is that for whatever reason, the uh, the the thing he's holding is the mm -hmm. corgi, according the corgi. To the Ultimania. I would have never guessed it that. Looks, I would have guessed a corgi, but I thought somebody said there was something like a chihuahua. Well, the chihuahua is the is the is one. Is it the black dog? Got the Clare the Clareth date. Yeah, the Cloud and Aerith segment is that is a chihuahua. chihuahua. Yeah, yeah. I, That's yeah. so funny. Yeah, and like the um. So yeah, it says so. Okay, do okay. you think there is a meaningful distinction between mm. all of the stamp worlds that appeared in the interlude and the beagle world because as we know the interlude seemed to be very Aerith centric right like all of the characters had special relationships with Aerith like even like old compilations one like the reason Kyrie is there Kyrie had a very explicit relationship with Aerith in The Kids Are All Right, which is the origin of her character. Mm. Uh, the, you know, um, Biggs was at the orphanage, and Biggs mm -hmm. actually uh, saved her in um, 
in the most traces of two past and the Aerith portion of traces of two past. Right. There's, so they have this connection. So there's all these very specific Aerith connections. We never see like, uh, or at least prior to the, or after the patch, we never see, you know, Corgi Cosmo Canyon. We never see any yeah. of that stuff. That's just Midgar and like this very insular, you know, sort of segment. Aerith says, this is my dream. Uh, there's also the homecoming right. references to it. Uh, so is there a meaningful distinction between the Beagle world and the rest mm -hmm. of them? Do you think the Beagle world is the main world and the other ones are sort of offshoots? So, yes. Okay. <laughs> I do think that the Beagle world is the main world. Okay. But I don't think that that's necessarily just because that's the main world doesn't make the others any less real okay. um so like it, it's not necessarily that they are like just dreams but there, there's something in the breaking of reality that happens at the end of remake okay. that has has created these new possibilities and it's it's also possible that I don't know. I, I'm just riffing here for a second. I like it. Um, it's the idea that in lieu of the planet offering governance and providence, what if Aerith isn't listening to the planet anymore because that governance and providence is gone? But now it's all of her dreams and all of her providence that is beginning to to be made manifest in these other options. That's that's one thing that I kind of wonder. Is she creating spaces that are going to allow for a subversion of whatever will Sephiroth has? It strikes me in her dream date with Cloud that they may be hiding out and sheltering from Sephiroth. Um, that was my first thought when I heard that. And then Sephiroth mm -hmm. appears. And then it's like, okay, we got to kind of get out of here. Um, but this seems to be a place where he may not be able to go. And then he appears. And she's got to kind of pull this failsafe sort of thing of pushing him through. That That's something that I kind of was, was thinking about. But I don't know. It, it makes me wonder, does Aerith become in some cases um the <laughs> yikes um to use some catholic energy um like the the mary of the planet right um kind of this idea of um a conduit of sorts a bearer of salvation mm. that was on, that was on my my question list was it because no. i just landed there this is the first time i've thought of that amazing so <laughs> yeah so there and um i'm not sure if you know this or not but in uh, crisis core um the goddess statue uh in the international edition was was straight up a, a statue of the virgin mary um I, and, I did not know that like the goddess statue like in in like the, like the Mer final minerva statue minerva yeah and uh, it became more Minerva-esque um, in the once it came over here. It was a localization change they made, I think, to be oh. respectful of of. Oh man! Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Thank you for being respectful, but also like that's some great imagery. Yes. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I I I too. I mean, I get it. That I get choice. It. I actually I I think they. I don't think that was a. I, yeah, I think that was a misread of the of all the audiences. I don't think it would have, yeah, yeah, uh, offended anybody. I mean, that's totally yeah. fair. But I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, totally. Me too. Um, so Minerva has this weird place in the lore too, and um, I, I certainly yeah. I feel like in Crisis Core it feels like a big deal. There's a lot of weird Genova stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. Weird imagery with all that stuff. Uh, I I'm really curious to see if they integrate that into Rebirth's lore. Oh man, I want it. 
I know. Like I, I, that's one of my favorite things of Crisis Core. I mean, you get the seven orbs and the seven days of creation. I was like, oh, and you got Genesis yeah. right there. I just, I, I just love that stuff. You know, the the other thing that kind of strikes me is with, um, if you look back at the Kabbalah tree and just like the whole setup and stuff, the two things at the top, um, the the two nodes, the spherot at the top. Um, it, there's this tension between um, uh, understanding and wisdom. And if Minerva is wisdom and Aerith is a stand-in for Minerva in some ways, then she represents this idea of planetary wisdom. Whereas, and I think this is also a really interesting piece, um, to that counterpoint of, of, say, the Setra, you've got like the Shinra who are seeking to manipulate understanding here for their own kind of creations. So, but, and yet both are, are kind of getting at the same sort of things, but in very different ways. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still kind of thinking about that, but I, I think that's a really cool idea as well. Well, I'm glad that I can excited. educate you on that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a solid detail. Um, that's new. I, I love that. I love that. Okay, mm. so the ending. Um, the let's ending. start with with the. Let's start with chapter thirteen and. Oh God, I love chapter thirteen. And and if you want to work in the Gi tribe lore, and and how you yeah you felt about that because I know that's technically a, a Cosmo Canyon thing. It um, is, but it, it's relevant here. It's relevant here. So let's let's yeah. let's talk about that. So, what were your impressions overall of the Temple of the Ancients thing? I I know that some people felt that the actual chapter dragged on a little bit, and I oh. I can see that a little bit. But I, the yeah, uh, sure, I can see that a little bit. But for the most part, I thought that like uh, had the best music, uh, oh, other yeah. than the live stream sequence in Chapter Nine, which has the best music. Mm. Period. You're probably listening to it now. Because they haven't yeah. figured out how to copyright it yet, um, <laughs> and uh, and so th I really liked that. I really liked um, I really liked just uh, pretty much every scene that wasn't like kind of a big dungeony sort of feel that wasn't uh, where you were like backtracking and it wasn't overly long. Um, and yeah. I think we maybe had one too many Turk fights. Uh, other than that, mm. I thought that it was it was a, a masterpiece of a chapter, uh, particularly the final three quarters so tell me your thoughts yeah. things that you noticed um i was i was jaw dropped the entire time from from landing the tiny bronco and just walking in i, I, I mean to me it, it didn't it didn't overstay its welcome but you also have to understand i was at a, 165 hours <laughs> and so it really wasn't a huge percentage sure, of my time sure. in the game um comparatively um but going through there like it just was so it was everything that i hoped it would be um go, going through um and, and yet i i had this fear that the temple of the ancients was going to be this um kind of labyrinth maze super frustrating and the first time i got to one of those gravity chambers i thought oh my gosh is this going to be like the water temple of ocarina of time am i going to have to go back and forth like raising and lowering the gravity and i was really nervous about that but it, it ended up being one of my favorite parts of of the whole game gameplay wise and the reason why was because it was rooted in just incredible aesthetic amazing music but then our girl got her moment like Aerith reuniting with her knowledge of the Setra, like stepping into herself to me that was amazing I, I could have gone around harvesting little green souls all the way to like for hours because i just loved that part i was like look at her she's learning she's and again i, I even I, I did it on um on stream and i i think i went off for like 15 minutes about this idea of um hebrew mystic devocate uh the idea of like she is practicing devotion to rekindle what she's lost that connection with the planet and i was just there for that moment um the, the whole time and so playing through that was a delight um gameplay wise let me let me say that for a second the red dragon fight was so fun yeah. i adored that fight the way that they use the pillars it's a smart fight that um 
made me think about not just systems, but about placement and location in a way that I, I was really excited about. Wait till um, you play it in hard mode. Oh man, I can't, I can't wait, I can't wait. Um, so that that was really awesome. Um, splitting the party up the way that they did, um, I thought it was cool to have Aerith and Yuffie together for a while, um, because that, that was a pairing that I didn't see a lot of. Uh, yeah. through the game so having her there and it certainly makes the ending that more meaningful with Yuffie um, as she's sobbing uh, over, over Aerith in the end but um, having having Yuffie, Aerith and Red run around together um, each with these unique experiences of, of the planet, you've got the Cetra you've got um, Nanaki and his um, his reverence for the planet, but in a different way. And then Yuffie, who comes from a very different concept. I, I just thought that was a great shared experience among those three. I, um, so I like the great. building. I, I certainly like the building of characters just through that port. Um, yeah. I do think, though, that uh, the the Yuffie bonding thing, um, I, I, I wanted a little bit more, because uh, yeah. as, as much as it was you could see her weeping and stuff in the um yeah yeah in the, as as much as that was good like immediately after and we'll get into the ending like during the actual like uh ending cinematic she's like making jokes and stuff it's kind of like yeah you, it's a little jarring yeah, it's a little jarring, um, yeah. I, yeah, yeah i did notice that yeah but beyond that i um i i did want more uh more yeah. chemistry between them but go on yeah i i agree um with, with that uh so separating them out, I, I thought that there was going to be a little bit more made of um, the gears and the timiness. I, I just remember in the original game, you've got that room that is like the clock. Right. I thought there was going to be a little bit more made with time. Um, I loved what they did with the trials, don't get me wrong. But um, thinking in terms of turning back the clock and what's this going to be, um, I thought that was going to be a bigger reveal, maybe, sure. lore dump than I thought. But honestly, I, um, if I did have a critique, and I don't know if it's a critique because it was just my own faulty expectations, I really expected Bugenhagen to explain more about the whispers than he did. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I was like, you really whiffed on that one. I've been looking forward to you for four years. But he was great. Um, but I've got a lot to say about him. Um, maybe maybe later on i don't know um cosmo canyon was a a great trip for me um but it also gave me a bit of a deconstructionist religious institution vibe that i was like oh man i gotta dig into that okay i i really want to dig into that because i you want to derail now for that because okay. i will so let's derail is <laughs> so like um i had just very recently been to a couple of um communities that are it feels like they based uh, Cosmo oh, Canyon really? on. If you've ever been to like Sedona, Arizona, or like yeah. um, a little little area uh, like Hurricane, or a little area outside of Zion National Park, okay. where it's like there are these beautiful desert, uh, you know, places that have been that are just like a bunch of white people appropriating native culture and like selling crystals <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. They exactly did that thing so well. It was like this yuppie commune yeah. there was some like legitimate interesting dialogue in there and i will say that it was sort of a localization choice uh mm -hmm. the, apparently the japanese and and from what i can tell the japanese version didn't really lean in as much but it did that mm -hmm. and i was kind of okay with that like because i do think like yeah you know it's this weird thing where you have like these people that are just kind of tourists in 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 helping the planet yeah. and being spiritual there are some people that were genuine about it but um, you know, like, uh, like right in the beginning, they get this, they get these, these narc posters basically like in their, um, you know, should we let you in? And they're from yeah. Shinra. Like they're most wanted from Shinra. And the answer is if you're wanted from Shinra, like the original Cosmo Canyon, the birthplace of Avalanche. Yeah. You're coming in. Like this mm -hmm. is the only place you're safe, but instead like they had to rely on, on, you know, Reeve manipulating the pictures to make the most hilarious facsimiles right. of generic blonde guy and everything. It was a good gag, but it was yeah. a good gag. But it was like, why should that matter at Cosmo Canyon? At Cosmo Canyon, right? And and so, um, 
you know there was that but then uh but then there was a little bit of like it was it was a layer right it was it was mm -hmm. like there's never never black and white no institution or society is black or white in this and i think that's yeah. good i think that's good overall but it did feel like oh man i ended up getting more of a lore dump from being a talk yeah. which was yes. good i was glad being awesome. talk showed up there me because too. it's like okay me cool too. and it showed that thing about it showed a little bit of nuance to even the cetera because one yeah. of the things that they defined you know they said they're not tolerant that the cetera yeah. weren't tolerant so i'll let you yeah. continue um wh what were your thoughts on the way the Setra were expanded in chapter 13. Yeah. Yeah. I, and so kind of to that same point, this this was what hit me about Cosmo Canyon and why I think I loved the temple so much. I was hoping that Bugenhagen was going to give answers and clarity to things that I've been conjecturing about, right? Like, tell me what the whispers are. Are they the foreknowledge of the planet, the governance, all this kind of stuff? You just use some buzzwords for me. Mm -hmm. And... um Tifa gives her experience with weapon, mm -hmm. right? She's like, that's not the cries of the planet. That's the cries of the weapon. And he immediately is like, no, that you don't know what you're talking about. It's time yeah. to put you in some classes. Like we need to teach you. Yeah. We need to indoctrinate you into our way of thinking because you clearly are not thinking yeah. clearly and as enlightened as us. Um, I'm going to liken this to the, the first time that I visited cathedrals in Europe or even um, went to Israel um, and Ooh. went to, I, I mean, I'll say it, right? Yeah. Like I go to these places and like they, they are these amazing, sacred, thin places, right? Right. And um, deeply meaningful to, to my traditions. So I go into these places and I'm inundated with a, a gift shop, right? It's like, buy this trinket. Um, I have questions about some things and you can kind of tell that I'm like the the guy that's like maybe a little antagonistic but like I love the stuff so I really have some deep questions right. and it's like no 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 we're not well, no this is what it is this is it's very institutional yeah. company line yeah. and that's what I love about academia and I, I think that you share this yeah. the same sort of thing like we love to ask the questions to pose some things in light of new information right, right. and when an institution is safeguarding itself it's very much like no no, no we're not going to ask those questions and we're not going to wrestle with that cognitive dissonance and that's how I felt Bugenhagen was responding to Tifa's experience and then Tifa goes to this scenario this kind of like group therapy session i guess yeah and again they dismiss it and it's like no no no. you're actually not about seeking the truth and the will of the planet you're about preserving your safe understanding of the planet and that was a a really anchoring moment for me um so then we go to the temple of the ancients and the gi and i'm like okay we're getting we're getting some of these questions kind of answered not fully but we're getting interpretations and new lenses to look at these things and that's what made it so powerful to me yeah um so both from gina talk and then certainly in the temple of the ancients when Aerith is is um hearing hearing um kind of the voices of the cetera but then also when you get that amazing um live stream depiction of the war of the ancients just am yeah. amazing stuff that's like okay genova like you get this this I, I i don't know i i don't even know what else to say beyond it just opened it up in a way that i was like this is what i kind of wanted from bugenhagen yeah yeah absolutely and um i think i think too laying out the struggle uh mm was so consistent with everything else that they sort of have said about Genova through the game that it did feel like the culmination. I'm not sure if you did you complete the Queen's Blood quests? Yeah, I did. I mean, those I were did. those That's were, amazing lore dumps of Genova and the Cetra and yeah, oh my gosh. Absolutely. And um and a lot of the imagery that we see in Queen's Blood, if we stick to the end, we see again in in the temple yeah. of the ancients and it's and that, that's why i was like oh my gosh that, i have that card okay. yeah <laughs> so good. yeah very cool stuff and i i think the the value of 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 all of that is going to pay off really heavy in 
the lessons the game is trying to teach us. Like, mm. Rebirth is... I'm not saying that there aren't, like... There isn't... You can't take meaning. There isn't meaning... There is meaning-making in Rebirth and in yeah. Remake. But, obviously, like, the, the big payoff from a meaning-making perspective is going to come in Part 3. And I really think that by making all of the different social elements, including those who came before, you know, like yeah. the way they sort of show the struggle of the Cetra and how Genova permeates their society. It looks like the, the Genova takes on some sort of uh, like royalty, like they uh -huh. they they sort of rule society and and some of some of the Cetra fall for it. And, uh, you know, so it's this they're not necessarily tolerant. And then when they uh, it, it seems like the, the narrative is that when they seal Genova or have issues with Genova, they become xenophobic and mm -hmm. don't allow the, the Gi to uh, enter the live stream. And as a result, the Gi retaliate, you know, and so yeah. all of that is it's setting a stage for, you know, a very big set of lessons to be taught yeah. in part three when we you know the war with wutai and all that stuff so i'll let you continue what did you think about the um when we're seeing uh you know we're seeing cloud uh start to fall even further we're seeing mm -hmm. him kind of lose himself to sephiroth we're seeing the trials what did you think about all those yeah so um cloud losing himself uh breaking through the wall with the sword was like oh my gosh he's like it's it's kind of a tantrum but it's also like the the entire party is like something's going on with cloud and I, I i love that tension that's the kind of tension that i wanted to see in this reimagining of of this story um because i i felt like in the original game they just don't say enough they don't object enough now that don't get me wrong i don't think they object enough here either yeah but um in the original game it was just like dot 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 yeah. you know tifa specifically and it's like that's great but yikes say something stop him and um or at least call him out and i feel like that um is is a great tension builder all the way through the te uh the temple yeah. when you get to the trial room this this is probably I mean, I, I almost feel like I have to do a separate top three for the ending two <laughs> chapters here. And like, I don't know where I would put this one, but it's up there. It's, it's probably number two for me. Um, and like the big moment is probably number one for me. Uh, but like this scene was so impactful. And again, I've only seen it once. Okay, so like I'm just going off of my fresh sort of thing. I know that people in the chat and probably you have like examined every frame of this at this point. So this yeah. is just where I am um, right now. But this particular scene worked so well for me from a from a theme of this trilogy standpoint that okay. I, I think that this is probably going to be remembered as as i for at least me the the crux and the centerpiece of this entire story um this this is the climax for me um even more so than the the actual climax because this is when the party defies fate um and that's that's something that i i think that i can talk about once we get to the the Aerith stuff at the end but her saying immediately after everyone goes through their trials, they've experienced their hardest, most difficult, most, um, I guess, bracket choosing moments in their lives, right? Um, each one of them has, has a choice based on what they are doing, uh, what's been done to them or happened in their lives. And Aerith kind of gives a, a framework that says what's been done what we've done the past is written we can't change that but that doesn't mean that the future is is set in stone um somebody in my chat the other night said i think it may have been subtext but he said why do you think remake leaned so heavily in the idea of defying fate if fate was not to be defied um like it just events 
happen the way that they always did. Here's my answer to that, because I, that question has lingered with me for four days now. Defying fate in this game is not about changing the course of action. Instead, defying fate is refusing to be a prisoner of what has happened to you and what is happening in your life. You're defying fate because you're saying that's not destiny, even that, though that's what's laid out for me. There's a book that I had to teach several years ago for um, one of the classes at, at Bama. Um, that's called Orphan Train. Um, it, it's a fiction book that dives into, it's historical fiction, of the um, the practice in the early 1900s of shipping orphans on, um, on the East Coast out West to work essentially as, as servants or slaves, even child slaves, um, all on farms, ranches, in, in manufacturers out in the West. It was um, this idea of we're going to give them a hope for a life instead of just being orphans, but they were essentially doing what was good for capitalism. Um, and so it's the story of this this kid who's ridden these trains. I actually later found out that one of my that my grandfather was one of these kids that was on oh. one of these trains. Yeah, it was wild. I found that out after I taught the class. There's a phrase at the end of the book that says, we spend 50, 60 years trying to reason and reckon with what happened to us the first 14 years of our lives. And to me, that is that, that was a powerful image in that particular book because they, much like the characters on Final Fantasy VII, they're on tracks. They are literally on a train and there's no getting off of this train we're mm -hmm. on. Destiny is set. You can't change the tracks, but there is a consciousness that can emerge that does not allow you to be a slave to those tracks, if that makes sense. Yeah. In this moment, these trials, this is when the characters defy fate, even though they can't deny history, past, present, or future. They're choosing a different reality in awareness and consciousness. That's why, for me, this is like the climactic crux of this game. Um, so that's that's what the trials did for me, um, and I've been reckoning with that ever since. To push back a little, I do yeah. think that one of the issues with uh, defining fate that way within mm. the construct of the story is that um it requires you a little bit to outsource symbolism and mm. i don't necessarily think it should be our job as consumers necessarily or as you know people that participate in the story it should sometimes be the the storyteller that tells us what something means and that's fair. and so if if we are required you know to to make the meaning associated with it it was perhaps not conveyed well enough and so mm. we're, we're in this we're in this you know unfired Chekhov's gun thing um but yeah. you know I actually do think that you know the um that the exploration of changing fate uh is not a red herring I think that we will see something uh that teaches us a lesson other than that our fate is predestined uh in a yeah in a uh concrete way in a uh surface level way i i, I think they are kind of they have you know sort of presented information that makes me think perhaps things will be just different enough to uh you know cash the check that's be written because I think there is mm. in a in a story, particularly that's about the fate of a planet, and that yeah. was used as a you know think piece on environmentalism, um, you know to eliminate agency in a story about that uh, maybe is not the messaging that that matched the messaging of the original, and uh, so I think yeah. it would subvert us into thinking well the planet's fate is the planet's fate and we shouldn't concern ourselves with it almost as a message i know that's not uh that's not literally what's being said but it is yeah 
it is the job of, of an author when constructing yeah. a story to consider that messaging. Um, so that's a, a mild pushback, but I think uh, fundamentally I understand what you're saying and uh, and agree that it's 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 a meaning that you could make from this story or from your life you know? yeah or from the story in general but uh, one, yeah. one, one other thing that I might say about that is um, something that this game is doing and I, th I think it's doing um, <clears throat> there was a thread of this in the original game but it's really leaning into it here this is a subversion but also a fulfillment of JRPG tropes. And so if the JRPG trope is to defy fate slash defy, defy the divine, uh, yeah. which I think is pretty common across JRPGs, yeah. um, <clears throat> especially in Final Fantasy more recently, but yeah. if if that's the case, then how can we, how can we change that? Uh, so there is no real classic divine here um, right. in this game. Like you've got the planet and there's, a, it, it is, kind of like a stand-in for the the big deity, yeah. right? Um, you know, I, not exactly. And that's why I, it, it's it's erroneous to say that the Setra are worshipers of a deity, but they are closely aligned with the deity figure mm -hmm. here, um, is, is the way that I would say it. Um, sure. Similar to how B Buddhism, for example, is very spiritual, but it's not worshipful in a, a religion classically. No. Um, but it's it's adjacent i suppose sure. um so they're, they're playing with that trope here um but I, I think they're playing with a number of tropes here so it, it's i think that it would be too simple uh maybe the simplest answer is always the right one right but i think it might be too simple to simply say um in order to truly defy fate there needs to be this almost like, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but I, I think that this is what a lot of people are wanting um, with narratives like this, this defiance of the divine or divine will or defiance of the prefer preferred order of things according to some outside agent. Um, that's something that I keep thinking about. How are they riffing on that between, say, the planet's providence and then, say, Sephiroth's providence? Is Sephiroth the divine that they are coming against, but that's, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, it, just kind of riffing there for a second. So I hear what you're saying. I, um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think probably it's split in terms of what people actually want. Uh, mm. Do they want this to be a reflection on why, you know, the sacred is sacred and the story is sacred. Yeah. Don't change this story. Um, yeah. But uh, there's other people that are like, okay, the the this game and its narrative, um, when it hit the scenes, uh, you know, changed the landscape. It, yeah. it set a precedent, and it um, it was truly original. And yeah. how do we? How do you? Is the most honorable way to pay reverence to the original is is that to be original again mm. and i i think i think the i'm leaning towards yes there's there's got to be yeah. at least a little bit of a new lesson that we get a new i, and I think I, it's hard yeah. for me to say that lesson is um you know about uh respecting uh divine providence i i think the lesson is is going to be something mm. A little bit more nuanced you know um yeah but you know i could be wrong and I, I think the the big one uh is still is still that it's going to expand upon um existing lessons to uh you know in the language of of modern times and that that having to do with identity and mental health um, yeah and which we haven't even talked yeah, about yet <laughs> yeah that's that's the big one because i think that's a that, big one <laughs> i think that's the crux still i think that's I yeah. more than anything more than the planet like i'm not saying fuck the planet guys um i'm saying that you know the this is okay, really Shinra. about identity and yeah this is really about identity and this is cloud's journey and and so okay well um what do we think about chapter 14 Right, we've got <laughs> so first off Gosh. we get that that portion of the interlude 
like the the culmination of the interlude the quote unquote true goodbye i watched I mean, you play I, this i watched you play this you the yeah. whole thing and you were you you never fell victim to this idea that i'm confused therefore this sucks you leaned in you were like this is amazing <laughs> and i was the same way and um i was like okay this man really gets me. Like I really felt this way. Like, <laughs> we there was never. Kidding. I was emotional through the whole thing, but also it was like this is incredible. A lot of it matched my real life feelings. Every time I've had yeah. significant grief, I've had that like lack of closure, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts going in? First of all, to like that. Um, we'll start with the interlude. What were your thoughts going into the final segment of of that story with? A cloud and Aerith wandering around and seeing the rift in the sky, all that stuff. What what did you think was happening there? What were the feelings that that invoked for you? What were interpretations you had and lessons that you got from it? Well, I, I think right, right on the heels of what we had just seen, the end of chapter 13, kind of clouds, um, subversion and... and um, I don't want to say betrayal of Aerith because it's not, he's not betraying her, but it, it kind of is a betrayal if you just look at Cloud as Cloud, you know? But we know that he's being controlled, or I, we assume he's right. being controlled, right? Um, and so on the heels of that, you have this very visceral sort of like, I hate playing as this protagonist right now because like I care for Aerith and I want... I don't want to do this to her. Like, I i mean, if you watch this part, you probably saw me pulling back on the joystick. I was like, yeah. do I have to go for it? Is it going to force me? And so he kind of goes into this like drunken stagger or whatever. But yeah. to me, that shift from the reality of what Cloud is experiencing to the idealized version of Cloud following Aerith around. These are her dreams and her desires, and she's wanting to get to the heart of it. And so to me, that's what I was kind of imagining, mm. right? How is this, and you even get to see her, and gosh, I don't know. I talked about this a little bit in my video on Elagor. The idea that Aerith's closest relationships had been the voices of the planet playing with the children hide and seek and while she mm. was able to have this conscious awareness of them she could never truly be one of them they could never come and find her and that's why cloud and tifa and barrett and uh, nanaki have been such a, a grounded moment for her in this dream she has those friendships or this closeness with someone that she's always dreamed of and you see her playing a role that she's never played before. She's this kind of giddy sort of like schoolgirl, right? Of like, oh, please, and like kind of pouty, flirty, this sort of thing. This is an era that she's never been able to be before because the weight of existence has been on her shoulders. Mm. This trauma from childhood. But then also, at least in Remake, when she had foreknowledge, she knows what it's going to cost. She has a, a foreknowledge of what her cost and sacrifice is going to be. But here in this moment, she's able to hide from that responsibility with someone that she deeply cares for. And there's certainly a conversation to be had of like, does she care for Cloud or the Zach in Cloud or whatever? Yeah. But it doesn't matter to, to me. Right. What matters is this is her trying to actualize in a way that's delaying her inevitability. Um, that's how I took that. And so it gives you the illusion of choice, even in like, what gifts am I going to give Aerith? But it really is her dreaming and her making, um, which goes into the, the making of worlds based on desire and intention. Mm -hmm. You know, she's made this world for them to experience, but also for him, Cloud, to consciously interact within. And I, I think that that is about Aerith's actualization, but it's also about helping Cloud see a piece of himself that she can give him a, a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm a big advocate for how, and I, I think the original game does this as well, for how Tifa restores 
so much of Cloud's psyche. But that's not to say that Aerith doesn't in many ways rekindle some of his psyche as well. Right. Um, right. I, I think that that's the, the importance of, of looking at all of the dates and all of the interactions among characters. Um, you know, in, in the, the sky wheel, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, for, for me, and I, again, I don't want to get you or myself in trouble in this, <laughs> but You're when right. it comes to a canon sort of thing, like each one of these relationships tells us a part of Cloud right. that we wouldn't know without that catalyst of the relationship. Right, right. So the conversation with Nanaki, the conversation with Yuffie, and then certainly with Aerith and with Tifa, it's, it's cloud like a jewel held up to the light that you're refracting, and you've got to see it all. Aerith here is helping Cloud find a sense of himself. And then she entrusts him, um, even saying, it's not about me, Cloud. It's about saving the world and you. Saving you, yeah. Just a powerful phrase there. So it's like all of this, yeah, I needed to know this, and this is my goodbye to you. But also, like, you need this for what's yeah. coming. So that's how I took that. I I love that scene. I think that segment is um, one of the mm. strongest. And... It did feel like uh, some people have said that it feels like the true goodbye uh, that that you mm. never got, and the goodbye um, that you never got. Yes, yeah. and I, I will admit that was my uh, takeaway, and um, it yeah. felt it felt kind of emotional. Uh, some people have different interpretations that uh, you know that Do that that things could uh, uh, be different this time, or you know that this mm. is a indication of things that you know they took time to show because. Uh, they're trying to offer us something um and you know uh i'll get those people on too but uh, for today that's that's the way that i interpreted that exchange yeah, it's just this yeah. uh a really kind of beautiful reflection on um on who she was what she represents and um and then and then how her relationship with cloud is going to shape the narrative because cloud is the narrative mm. and uh, yeah, that it's it's one of those segments where I really felt like the connection to um, the yoga Kara in particular, like when we yeah, because, oh, I'm glad you I'm, mentioned that. I'm not sure if you you uh, you're up on all the interviews. I'm sure it would have been impossible for you of all people to um, uh, avoid this news. But something that no, I had said, everyone and everything yeah. muted and blocked. So you, you did a good job, but in in the yeah. Ultimania, uh, something that Nojima says is that if you study collective unconscious from Young and <laughs> Yoga Kara, you could probably divine the ending of this game. Yeah, and so that's uh, hilarious to me because it was around uh, chapter nine where I was like. And I, I could not name Yoga Kara at that moment. Right. But I said, I, I spent um, a couple of months over in um, Indonesia and China and South Korea, um, kind of studying a lot of things, visiting various temples and stuff. And I could not place it. I was like, what is the name of this, this like world creation sort of thing, like where, where we're kind of creating realities? And stuff, and I, so I, I actually contacted a friend of mine who um, is much more um, into, um, like, a, a more proper adherent of, of Buddhism than I am. And I was like, "Hey, this is there, there's a concept that I'm trying to practice. I'm trying to think." And he said, "Oh, that's Yoga Kara." And so I was thinking about Yoga Kara in Cosmo Canyon, going through it. I was like, "Okay, how does this?" And so I didn't know that um, was it Nojima, yeah. Nojima, this or yeah. that. I did not know that. Um, the, the collective unconscious thing, I, I think, is um, pretty rife in the original game, too. So that was already kind of in my mind, but not quite to this level. I mean, it's it's just... Um, yeah, and it's it's sort of a... Collective unconscious is, for, for those that don't know, um, if you yeah. want to chime in on the explanation, but it's sort of um, the one of the... A base terminology for yeah. um, 
uh, the Jungian concept that there is a m sort of mimetic component yeah. to social growth, that uh, we there's these shared uh, sort of instinctual memories mm -hmm. and uh, concepts that are built into us that uh, cause us to, uh, you know, develop the way that we do. And um, it, it's, it's really so built into the idea of the live stream uh, and memetics that yeah. to say that it's it's like something new to rebirth it would be kind of disingenuous it's yeah very much just the live stream uh and advent children really leans into the way that works in a uh like mechanical sense we see oh like yeah sephiroth uh essentially um you know uh, using memetics to like uh influence his will right. like he from and this this goes back to a little bit like what you were saying like the idea that dreams are real in in this in this universe are not mm -hmm. new to the compilation uh from the live stream Sephiroth uh, manifests Kadaj Laz and Yazoo like they're not mm -hmm. they're not unphysical things they're just things that he manifests and so we already see elements of you know collective unconscious being yeah concrete in the world system of and having actual consequence in the world system of, of final fantasy 7 beforehand yoga kara though has this um really really emboldens this idea that things like hopes dreams mm -hmm. fear resentment yeah um despair all of those things have a a specific outcome on the way that fate can kind of flow and um yep. it's it's sort of uh i don't want to i don't want to like it's hard i i hate like comparing this to something that's there's you know sort of a, a word deficit here there's sort of a uh yeah uh, an issue so, but i think for commoners people might think of something like the secret as you know like right as right. as like the way that that would it, but it it's actually like a modality that uh, it's like uh -huh. a, one of the schools of thought of of buddhism is yoga kara um right and it's it's more of yoga like it's actually more of a concept of yoga and it's like this idea that it's the way that the universe is conceptualized is through consciousness mm -hmm. um and so you throw in that the universe is conceptualized through consciousness and that the world is built through collective unconscious mm -hmm. and you've got collective unconscious the live stream and mm -hmm. then you've got the top layer world the beagle world yoga kara you know and it's yeah. that's again a, a huge simplification but it does really allow us to open up you know for terms of theory crafting it, it opens up the entire plate for us like we can literally yeah. do anything we want from those two things but what it can do is it can help us explain mechanically what's going on, so go on. which I which I absolutely love, you know, right. and I, I think that there's that there's so many different threads here that go into this, you know, it, it almost reminds me to some degree of um, uh, in uh, in Walker Final Fantasy 14. There's this great discussion that I lost my mind over um, uh, about the um, Aristotle's intellecti. Right. It's the idea of like there's this this um, kind of um, terminal point that if you are kind of believing in, then you're moving or orienting towards it. And so it's it's almost like taking that a little bit further, like the, instead of this birth of of Medion that's going to destroy everything, right. it's creating new realities and all of this stuff because of an orientation that allows for a manifestation of those dreams, hopes, even fears and sadnesses, which is something, oh gosh, what a beautiful phrase. Not beautiful, it's re actually really dark. When <laughs> Sephiroth says, oh, the, these fears, these, these, this pain, the, the planet feeds on these things. It's like, oh, oh my gosh. But it's this idea of new realities being created, not just from desire and dream, but broken dreams. Right. And like desires that 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 are, are flawed and are, are failing um, to be fulfilled. Right. To right. me, it, it just spirals into every possibility. And to me, that is um, 
Yogacara doesn't necessarily speak, um, at least to my knowledge, to all of those negative sort of sides of things, but it's always kind of this kind of heightened reality creation of, of desire, kind of like the secret sort of stuff. But what's happening here is that there's the alternative as well. There's a, there's a darker option um, that fuels the planet um, just as much. Uh, anyway, there's there's a lot to be said with that, yeah. and I I ambushed I have, you with it apparently. Yeah. Did you say what? I ambushed you with it apparently. I didn't know a little you didn't bit, know a little that. bit. Yeah. Oh man, I, so I did not know. So I had um, subtext mentioned something about because uh, he he has been following my journey through rebirth, goading me on to finish for mm -hmm. about three weeks now. Um, but after I finished, he mentioned something about. Um, yoga car and if I'd ever studied it and I was like well I've got a bit of a cursory knowledge but it's something that I've been reading up on since about Cosmo Canyon and um, I, I guess all I can say right now is that I am meeting with a, uh, a professor of uh, Jungian psychology and mm. then another professor of um, Eastern spirituality um, in the next two weeks and I'm taking meticulous notes that I was like listen great. this is I'm just going to buy you some coffee and I just have a lot of really random questions. Just go with me <laughs> and uh, we're gonna have a good time, but we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, that sounds fun. And uh, you'll have to let us know how that, Oh, I will. How that I absolutely will. So, okay. Uh, we're, we're a lot of lofty concepts. Uh, yeah. But we're, what gosh. is it? What does it all mean for us? So uh, that, that takes us to the, the beginning of, of, Chapter 14 proper after the yeah. interlude section where you are you're in uh, the forgotten temple and um, yeah. you can just walk there from the city of the from the temple of the ancients, which yeah, I think new. is a, I think that that makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, yeah. it, it was a uh, it was always strained plausibility, especially since they uh, brought up the plot point that um, uh, yeah. Aerith can barely make it up a mountain. So for her to get from the southern island to the top on her own. Did strain some plausibility but um yeah uh so there's that uh we get there there's but, but before that we we were like exited and then there's the situation with the white materia right so we're handed right. a white materia um there's the big speech with sephiroth saying this is the nature of all things and then uh i give you my blessing your he says that specifically he's mm -hmm. well first he says um you know, you should join the reunion, uh, and then Cloud sure. resists. He says, "You're, I see you're resisting. I guess you need a little push. push. I give you my blessing." He comes out, mm -hmm. and then there's the conversation with Aerith. He hands Aerith a full white materia. He puts mm -hmm. it in her hair in this in in a dream version, sort of of the right. of the sleeping forest. Uh, hands it hands him back an empty shell. Then we come down the. The, the Temple of the Ancient Steps. Vincent's there. It plays mm -hmm. the Promised Lands theme song. So Sephiroth good. shows up and yeah. uh, and the world craters open up. He's like eating live stream and, mm -hmm. uh, and he says stuff to you. Uh, then you fight some white whispers who don't want you to go in. You come yeah. to the wall. You come to the wall and then there's the black whispers specifically let Cloud and only Cloud in. And then mm -hmm. it happens. Tell me what was going through your mind when all of that happened and then it happens. The faded scene. Walk us through the journey. Oh, man. Um, so, I, I mean, I was like, why am I fighting all of these whispers? Like, I, okay, the, the like, live stream whispers, like the planet whispers are on my side, but they're, they're keeping me from this. And then it kind of dawned on me. I was like, okay, they recognize something's wrong with Cloud perhaps mm -hmm. um and that that was my take on that i didn't linger too much in that um the um the purple eye whispers um darker whispers they mm -hmm. um are blocking out the party and then they allow cloud in and i think again that's kind of like a oh no we're gonna let him in uh, and that's kind of the I give you my blessing and here's the push you're about to need to fully fracture you um to make you a true puppet. Um, that's the way that I took that. Um, there was... Going up to the altar, there was never a moment 
in four years when I was convinced that Aerith would live. Um, so <laughs> I was like full on, like, we're doing this here. Yeah. And like, so, so it, it wasn't like, okay, these white whispers know that Cloud is going to, he's a danger to Aerith, so they're keeping him out. These uh, black whispers are realizing that he's a conduit for Aerith's death, so they're going to let him in. So that I, I wasn't thinking too much about. We get into the, um, we get beyond the veil. Um, let me say this. Um, if I did have a disappointment, um, it was just a choice. I'm not disappointed by it, but I, I'm, I'm curious um, if we'll get it in part three. Um, there's something about walking through this hauntingly lonely yeah. forgotten capital in the original game that I really missed. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I, I understand the like, let's, let's go, but it, uh, I don't know. To me, I was like, ah, oh, that, fans that's, of, that's fans cool. of my show will know that that's, that's my primary complaint too. And the yeah, music that like, they chose, I thought was, I didn't think the, the music promised that land was, chose, was good for that i see it worked but i think that it would have worked better if it had like like volumed down and then we had the classic yeah. da, 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 to, so that i could wander around the lonely capital yeah um absolutely because it's almost like in the original game um one thing that i did like was yeah it's ushering me to the middle but like there's a lot to explore here and it's lonely and there's nothing really to find but it's an ambiance that i'm like all about um but but i wonder if we're going to get some of that exploration in in part three um and i'm okay with that but in this moment anyway small gripe yeah you go into the the veil of whispers and um the planet sanctuary i think is what it's called and it was immediately like tonally it, it shifted for me it was like okay the chaos of the whispers is behind us it's just it is lonely and it's cloud and you know Aerith is is near mm -hmm. and the entire time like i i think that as i was playing through i slow walked i was like this is cinematic for me i'm not like yeah. pressing r2 and sprinting toward the altar uh because i know <laughs> what's there um and i'm just kind of taking it all in um to me it was haunting, um, but it's an escalation of tension right. in a very subtle way. And that, again, worked. You go down the elevator and then you get the little notification, hey, rest up, um, go make sure everybody's got their materia. I still didn't put materia on Kate Sith. I completely <laughs> forgot that one. Um, I like just completely raw dogged that final boss with a <laughs> very bland Kate Sith, but not the part that I lost to. Kate Sith did his part. Um, go figure, even without materia. So, um, but I, I, I did that, and then you walk to the altar. Um, dude, that slow walk to the altar is a, is a top moment in gaming for me, because you're hearing Aerith try to pray mm -hmm. and she's not good at it. Right. Right. And it's like, oh man, this is so, and it's almost heartbreaking. My mom never taught me. I, I hope I'm doing this right. I yeah. may not ever have a chance to learn. And it's like, oh my gosh, yes. it's just, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. And, and like, you're walking forward and I'm like, she doesn't know what she's doing. I'm about to kill her or like, I'm going to be like yeah. complicit in her death. Yeah. I'm complicit in her death. And like, I know what's coming and it's just this heart wrenching moment of she knows what she has to do and doesn't, she's not able to do it. Yeah. Just powerful. So making my way up to that moment, the music begins to swell. The whispers are like, all of them. And it's both of them. It's the white whispers and the black whispers. And I'm like, I don't even know what's happening anymore. Yeah. Are they fighting each other? Or are they keeping me from it? I don't even know. Um, so it's intentionally confusing. And then you get the moment of him raising the sword and like, you're just tapping the controllers. I thought that was amazing. Um, and then, then it happens. Like 
that moment happens. And it was... I ran the, the, the whole gauntlet of emotions there because it's like, okay, he stopped. The whispers are, are uh, assuaged at this point. Sephiroth comes down and like, I haven't gone back and seen my exact reaction. I need to watch it. But like, when Cloud hits the, the Masamune, it's just like, holy crap, he's gonna do it. Like, yeah. is she gonna live? Like, it, yeah. like I'm, I'm falling for the bait that they left four years ago that I've never fallen for. And I'm like, is yeah. it gonna happen? No, it's not gonna happen. And then the sword goes flying off and Sephiroth lands. And I'm like, did I just divert? Did I just change destiny? Yeah. And like, for, for that moment, I was like, now what? And I fully expected Sephiroth to like, do a spin and then a delayed stab like Arya Stark yeah. at the end of Game of Thrones. Like, oh, uh, got the throat, boom, done. Like, that's what I was fully expecting. But then you see the blood begin to trickle. Yeah. And you see that Cloud, a new reality has been created that Cloud's living into. And it's based on his dreams and desires. And I was like, this is a different, th this is, this is a take that I am so excited about at mm. this point. Like I was not disappointed in that moment because again, I was like, as soon as I saw that blood, I like, there was a fleeting, maybe three seconds where I was like, she lived. And then I saw the blood and I was like, he just thinks she does. Mm. And she's, she's dead. That's it. You see her begin to fall and all of that. And I was like, this is this is hitting at a different level than the original game for me. Um, because it's like, just like we've all been in on the big secrets of this game from 1997, now we're in on the biggest thing in this game and we're waiting for Cloud to come around to it. And that creates a whole new level of tension that's, I don't know, it was fresh for me. It was good. It was good. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I Maybe I should stop there for a second and be like, okay, so. So, okay. Um, what can I talk about? Well, so your thought was that yeah. when he's diverting the blade, yeah. it's because he's created a new reality. That's your thought where that's he, or like yeah. a new dream where she's there well it's it or do you think it's uh, going illusion. back with yeah mm -hmm. i don't think it's an illusion I, I i i don't believe that any more than any of the interlude stuff is an illusion i think that these are realities but they are not the governing providence of the, of the planet right mm -hmm. And so for, for me, it's like, again, going back to the tagline of the very first trailer, what is fact and what is fiction? Well, but post whispers, all of it's fact. Like every one of these realities exists. And you have certain characters whose psyches are, are seemingly traveling and clouds fractured psyche mm. is in some ways dissociating from the things that he doesn't he can't handle it's a breaking point for him um and and i think that that has a lot to do with what we're going to see in part three um and i, I think that we're going to live those moments in excruciating pain and detail in part three um and not just this one but the death of his mother um, that you catch mm. glimpses of, but you get from a different perspective in Nibelheim. Um, you're going to get all of the moments that Cloud has censored for himself because he can't handle it. And it's going to be, it's going to be a, like a, a, a rage train of depression <laughs> sure. um, when we get to that moment. And I, And so like, I'm okay with almost being like a bystander to everyone else's sorrow in rebirth because i know that it's going to hit times a hundred in part three 
Or at least that's how I'm feeling about it at this point. Now, so is so I, I don't know if that answers your point. I'm just rambling. I think. So is Aerith dead or alive? Yeah. She's dead. Okay, she's dead. So the way that I and I, I mean I I think that we kind of thought her saw her true death. Um like kind of the mm-hmm. maybe one of the last worlds she's alive in or or whatever. Yeah. Uh in the far- farewell scene. Um, and that she's yeah. operating kind of in this, in this omni Aerith state, um, yeah. you know, and that what Cloud is really saying is something that it's a dream that mm-hmm. either she, Aerith is feeding him so that he survives the moment yeah. or, um, you know, it's, it's a manifestation of his resistance to sephiroth's endgame i think what sephiroth and Genova have done in this yeah. uh, what the what rebirth is really solidified is, which is really like pretty solid in um uh advent children and on the way to a smile lore is that their yeah. food is despair like that's that's literally how they they take control of of live streams and yeah. so yeah. we see like roche lose hope, and then become a robe. We see the same thing happen to Broden. And Mm -hmm. particularly when it happens to Roche, Aerith approaches Cloud immediately after and says, don't worry, that's not going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. I promise. And then Tifa locks eyes with Aerith first, and then Cloud says, yeah, we won't let it. So it Mm -hmm. feels like they've hatched a plan, you know, um, a little bit to, to... to to save Cloud. And, you know, Aerith's endgame is to save Cloud. Sephiroth seems to be the opposite, to, like, corrupt mm-hmm. Cloud. I think they both want to save Cloud in the wrong way. In a and, different way, yeah. And yeah. so, the push from Sephiroth's perspective is kill Aerith, turn him into a rope. Get him to join yes. the reunion. Um, the push back is Aerith going, hey, you you wanted to save me in this moment. Here's a vision yeah. of that. This is the all that your fragile mind can handle right now. So mm. I have to do what I can to make you survive this moment. And then we see Sephiroth when Eris shows up in that dream fight, you know, yeah. um, uh, and says, "I underestimated you." She's talking. Mm-hmm. He's talking to Eris because. Aerith outplayed him in that moment, prevented it yeah. from being a robe. So that's the way that I... Um, oh, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, that's the way that I kind of have... I think pretty early on, that's kind of the way that I, yeah, I thought yeah. that was meant to play out. Okay, so interesting question. Um, they, make a cho- they make a very specific point uh, yeah. not to show any stamp bags near the end of the game. Isn't so, that interesting? Yeah. So my assumption, my assumption was that, you know, the, the Beagle world still sort of is, is the prime world, you know, it's the, mm-hmm. the primary world and we're going to see Beagles moving forward in the main game. Sure. Zach though. So Zach shows up in a church and he's like, mm-hmm. you know, somewhere in a church, the flowers are alive, you know, in the church. Mm-hmm. And where is Zach? Is Zach just straight up alive now? Uh, um, I, I mean, yes. <laughs> okay, he's alive as much as anyone is alive right in there. Um, outside of the 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 Beagle context, now he could be in the Beagle context. I don't know, right? Mm. Um, but the um the the, the way that I kind of think about it is that um. He is alive in these alternate options and and des- desire created worlds. <laughs> um, now, which one is he in? I, I'm not sure. I've got enough context to really know about that. Um, the The thing that I I, I also kind of am thinking about is Sephiroth says to Cloud. And and you you are more familiar with this. You've probably seen it more than me. 
he says those with clouded eyes cannot see re- reality or what's real. Yeah, that's the sense of it. Um, okay. Yeah, with clouded so, eyes. Yeah. So my question is, how are clouds' eyes clouded? Is he perceiving the world? And you know, I, I'm <laughs> you're the lore guy. I'm the lens yeah. guy, right? Yeah. Um, what lens is is cloud seeing the world through at this point? Is he seeing it? Is he? Is this the reunion of worlds that he is now able to live and see in a lens and operate through one that is not beagle? You know, um, whereas the rest of the party, they're not able to see, say, Aerith. Um, Red um, has a brief sense of her, but doesn't I, I don't get the, uh, the the idea that he's able to interact with her um, the way that Cloud does. So it makes me wonder, is Cloud in this in between sort of space? of like he's in this world, but he has a sight beyond it. Like he's able to see the rift um, in the sky and everybody else is like, what are you talking about? It's just a blue sky. Um, And so it does make me wonder, is he seeing and experiencing a different version of the world than, than the others? And I, I mean, I think that he is, but does that explain it? Is he coexistent in the, Harry or Chihuahua or Corgi. Yeah. Uh, so there's there. I do have a lot to say on this particular topic, oh, okay. and it is, it's it's interesting. So if you wander around in the interlude world, whatever. Um, yeah. One of the thing you hear them say is that 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 means that that uh, rifts is an indication that the world is marked for death. That they're they've run out of life stream, and that's uh, okay. what that, so. I do think that. On a that it, thematically, it's an indication that this world is marked for death. Mm-hmm. the 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 color scheming of that rift is really similar to one of the you you know the two galaxies at the end of remake that yeah uh, you look at there's the yeah. there's the red galaxy behind you and then there's the right. yellow one it looks kind of like a yellow flower. Um, now uh. s- strangely, like our world will become part of it one day. Sephiroth is looking at the yellow galaxy, you know, and that, and yeah. also in the storyboards on the Ultimania, that is referred to as the universe of death. Okay. Death. So yeah. even though the rift doesn't quite look like it, it matches the same color scheme and it, it looks reminiscent of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like as if maybe when the, that world finally dies, it looks like that, you know? Uh, mm. And also I sent you a picture. I sent you a picture in chat. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, the the rift looks very similar to the rift in Cloud's mind. I Someone think sent this to me. Yeah, I um, think that's intentional in twi- on Twitter. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and like from um from from kind of remake days, I I've kind of wondered if we are seeing these multiple multiple versions of Cloud that are going to actualize into one. Right. And, so, and I think that this kind of speaks to that because that is the backdrop of the place where Cloud reforms all of these disparate consciousnesses. I think that what I took as, as very symbolic in the original, and it's still symbolic here, it's becoming very literal here in, in the remake trilogy in that you've got multiple clouds across multiple worlds that are all going to be merging into one. Mm. It also makes me wonder, you know, is that the case with more than just cloud? Is there going to be a, a merging of of uh, individuals, um, like in in the party? You know, um, I think that one of my questions in the beginning of the game was: we've got a, a presumably dead uh, Tifa, Red, Barrett, um, in in the interlude the very first interlude mm-hmm. thing so what happens with these other versions of these these characters as well i, I, I don't know the, these are just questions that i'm asking no right and, now but and there's not an answer yet um yeah something i don't think we got enough to no, yeah. Uh, yeah i think it was left totally unclear but w- one thing yeah. that um w- one of the vibes i got from it is that these aren't parallel worlds like that's not the right way to say that and mm-hmm. um 
Mm-hmm. And Nojima confirmed that in the Ultimania. It's like, there oh, yeah. are multiple worlds, but don't think of them as parallel. And yeah. there's actually, there's some dialogue in, in Cosmo Canyon that I think sort of recognizes the nature of this and that, that this is the, these worlds are within the live stream. You know, yeah. they're within the planet and yeah. that the world outside of it has a live stream and is related mm-hmm. to the live stream and things in the live stream can manifest in the world. Yeah. But the there is a, a discrepancy in their nature and that the live stream isn't as simple as the afterlife because it can yeah. make manifest you know things right. in the in the real world um you know so for me i think that those the the aspects in these different worlds are reflections of real world counterparts and so mm. if parts of them die I don't think it has an impact on the, the ones on the outside. Um, uh, yeah. I think instead they're reflective of the, the ones. Uh, I think the reflection goes the other way. Um, mm. So I, I don't, there, there aren't real answers to like what, how the live stream works. It's a little vague and that's a little yeah. frustrating, you know, too, from a storytelling perspective because. The live streams right. become so powerful that it sort of uh, convert can kind of veer into Deus Ex uh, yeah, right. uh, territory. But I think there are definitions that are we just don't have yet as to how it's all going to work, and that there are real consequences. And um, you know that at the end of the day, we're going to have a story that um you know, largely covers the same topics, but may have a little, some surprises. I mean, obviously yeah. the main thing that, that the story is, is accomplishing is it's unifying all the lore from 27 mm-hmm. years of compilation stuff and different authors yeah. and under one umbrella. But yeah. So that's what I think, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think that that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, and it also makes me wonder, and I, I'm trying to think back to what Sephiroth says, um, when he's describing the birth and death of worlds, right? And I'm trying to remember, does he say what happens to a world when it dies? Does he say that it it returns to the planet? Like, I, I'm trying to remember. He doesn't you know actually... Those, he, yeah. Well, so, okay, this is interesting. So, this this factors into something strange about the way Sephiroth is characterized here, and that he's trying mm-hmm. to extend the life of the planet. And yeah. when he talks to Aerith, one of the things that he says is, um, you can join me in eternity. And mm. Aerith says, there is no eternity. And eternity, and Sephiroth says, not yet. Not yet, right. And so it, there is something to be said about that we don't really know the full nature of life and death in Sephiroth's plan. Mm-hmm. You know, but that he he seems to be very afraid of death. And yeah. I think we're going to get context on that. Phil actually came up with a good idea involving Glenn and all that stuff. What did you think of Glenn? <laughs> I don't know anything about Glenn. Um, so I, I haven't played Ever Crisis. But, you don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but to me, I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, this uh, kind of Genova co-opted sort of um, Glenn. Uh, I, I guess um, he is really interesting to me because he seems to have a relation with Rufus that both strikes fear in Rufus, maybe because Rufus killed him in the past, um, but also kind of this haunting sort of manifestation to Rufus. It's almost like Glenn is to Rufus what Sephiroth is to Cloud um, in, in this kind of skulking, haunting sort of way. And I, I think that's really cool. Um, I am excited to go to Wutai to learn more about Glenn. Um, so there's that. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, my first thought was, um, oh man, is this Cloud's dad? But I, I don't know. So, <laughs> uh, Yeah, that's... Like, uh, it's nothing not, to go with. Uh, um, right? But it's like, it's it's kind of like in in Star Wars when it's like everybody has to be related. I'm like, oh, everybody has to be related here. So. It does, yeah. I thought the same thing. I mean, we yeah. were all like, oh no, this is. It feels like they're really 
Uh, but it's but it could be this could be an actual red herring like this could be yeah the the version of a red herring that that people yeah could actually get behind but um i think that the added lore of knowing that blen was like part of soldier first uh you know first yeah. uh, like the first soldier of the project zero uh doesn't actually matter in the context of this what what seems to yeah. matter is that he has an uh, one, um, he's ruling Wu Tai and potentially Avalanche with Rufus yeah. at this point. Um, it's probably it was probably obvious to you. Uh, it was it was super explicit in in Japanese because um, uh, Saruf is a it was an anagram is, for Rufus. R Rufus, which was like really yeah, clear. I was like, yeah, and it, it was like, yeah, rich rich kids, right? And I was like. Uh, you're you're saying that Rufus is Saruf, right? Like yeah, that's a that's what he's saying. Yeah, that, that's yeah. what I was picking up on. I was like, oh. okay, but then I was like, yeah, because it's almost like Rufus backwards feels like a little bit like Saruf, but yeah. It, anyway, it's I don't know, or is it an anagram like like you're saying? Yeah. Um, ah, man. One other thing, and I I know that we want to do questions and and stuff, but my big kind of question is what will meteor do um and with yeah. the expansion of all of these worlds this is something that i have been thinking about and, and really i've been thinking about it since maybe my second um remake lecture video um the original kind of story talks about creating a wound in the planet so great that all the spirit energy would gather there and he'll be Sephiroth will be in the middle to absorb that spirit energy um, and become kind of a planet, a deity, a god of it himself. Here, it's it's kind of interesting because that's why I asked the question of what happens to a world when it dies. Mm. And when when these worlds before the end of Remake when people made choices, the existence of that possibility of world just dies. You know, it's just like, that was a no, this is a yes, we're going this way. And it just immediately died. But now, this creation of possibility through Yogacara or collective unconscious, whatever it is, you know, it, it just coexists out there. So my question is, when that dies, does it just continue on into per perpetuity or does it return to the life stream is the life stream memories is the are, are the collection of life stream memories being so diluted that it weakens the power of the the life stream and planet itself to a point that sephiroth can then co-opt it and then call forth meteor across every world ending every world and then and every possibility and then absorbing all of those into himself i'm not really sure but i'm trying to connect some of these threads from the original game mm. into this and i'm not really sure that's why i'm curious what happens to a world when it is destroyed um because he hasn't correct me if i'm wrong he hasn't mentioned standing in the wound in rebirth has he no. Okay. So maybe that's just a thread that's just not going to be in this in this trilogy or maybe it's it's waiting for part 3. I I don't know. I, it's something that I'm thinking about though. Interesting. Um Who did you get on your gold saucer date the first time? <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> so I got Tifa. Oh, well, the first time, chapter eight or no, chapter, chapter 12. 12. That's the only one that matters. Chapter 12. Yeah, yeah. At Tifa. I got Tifa. What did you think of that sequence, by the way? I thought it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, the entire chapter 12 um, from uh, in the Gold Saucer, it was amazing. Um, Loveless was out of this world. Um, uh, like, I cannot wait to see the live performance uh, at the Rebirth. Uh, world concert or whatever i uh, i'm that's going to be amazing um but the entire date sequence was amazing uh, the the sky wheel piece with tifa i felt was deeply meaningful and it shows a 
side of cloud that is vulnerable and intimate. Um, it's just kind of beautiful. I, I loved it. So what's funny is I really did not expect to get Tifa. And so I actually streamed that and I was floored when I got Tifa. Floored. I was floored. Because I, I, um, this does not say anything about preferences for shipping. But for narrative reasons in the original, I really liked Aerith's date. I like Aerith saying to Cloud, I'm trying to find you. And I wanted to see the interpretation of that in Rebirth because I thought that it was a really powerful thing. Now, I, I love the Tifa and Cloud dynamic. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I was really curious about some of the Zack lore that might have come up in the Skywheel. Um, so I was... Not for romantic reasons, but I was actively <laughs> trying to get the Aerith date, and uh, I came to find out I failed spectacularly for that. Um, so I did. Like she was always in my party, did all the synergy things, all the folios, but she, I, she was actually like the fourth highest for me. And I guess it's just because I was, I don't, I didn't think I was being mean to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, sometimes it's yeah. If you're going in blind, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but I, I was like, you know, I'm not gonna. I'm yeah. just going to play it like I play it and we'll, we'll see. But I did kind of try to lean and I failed. So <laughs> I was definitely too thorough in the side quests. Yeah. I was very thorough too. Um, I think yeah. I was in kind of tie mode. It's hard to tell because uh, oh. the first playthrough you can't. Um, now you can't see. You can't um, see. Yeah. Um, okay. Well. I have a question. We brought okay. up what we think. So I think both materia, both the black materia and the holy materia seem to have like an updated set of lore things to them. And in remake, what do you think Aerith did at the at chapter 14 or at chapter 17 at the portal? Um Right before going into the... She cast that spell. Sorry, yeah. chapter 18. Um, she cast the spell on that portal, kind of purifying it. What do you think she's doing there? What do you think Holy does? That's interesting. Um, I haven't thought about that. Um riffing right now i wonder if it's possible that she expended the holy materia to combat that moment did it if holy is almost like a if meteor is the greatest destruction materia mm -hmm. then holy conversely could be the greatest creation materia and so is she Reef. i'm wanting to say she's i mean she, I, I think she's doing the work of creation amidst destruction it's almost like i'm not entirely sure but it, it does strike me that maybe that's how the material was expended. I haven't thought about that. No. Interesting. So, something that I've sort of wrestled with is that why was the... Why were we able to get the contents of Holy Materia from the live stream? Like, was it just yeah. another world? A parallel world where there is a... a, a where there's you know like a a holy that didn't get used that didn't get eaten by the whispers mm. um i didn't read it that way i think she put it there in that sequence um wait uh hang on say that again i think she uh, put the it. contents of holy into the portal and that's why it was empty because if you if you okay, listen to the dialogue about it she says the whispers actually, especially in Japanese, whispers remove the memory of what happened. 
not necessarily mm-hmm. what actually what the contents were. Um, yeah. And so I think they retrieved the contents there. And I think that Holy is the mechanism by which Aerith is doing all this stuff. The the way that she is Omni Aerith, the way that she is kind of playing this chess with Omni Sephiroth is through Holy. Holy has mm. enact, enacted her to uh, purify the whispers because I think the whispers were initially just Sephiroth's corruption on the live stream. Right? They mm. look like robed reunion clones. Like mm-hmm. they look like um, which and we see those robed figures on the murals, by the way. We see robed figures that yeah. were the Cetra, right? So the dark so I think the the whispers were and this is kind of the my latest iteration of this. I think the whispers were were the Cetra <laughs> initially. And yep. that Sephiroth purified uh, you know, corrupted them in the live stream. Mm-hmm. Uh and that's the when we see the will of the Cetra, uh mm-hmm. we're seeing we're seeing Sephiroth or Genova controlled Black Whispers. And yep. then what Holy has done is Holy has allowed Aerith to be enacted her to be the steward of the quote unquote white whispers or the uncorrupted mm-hmm. cetera. And I think there's mm-hmm. there's uh, a bunch of imagery that goes into that, like that Cloud is, you know, a Sephiroth clone that gets purified through mm-hmm. you know the the events of the story. I think there's some beautiful imagery in that. But uh I do think that the whispers are quite just literally the souls of the Cetra in the life. Yeah. Stream. Um I do like that. And I, uh, I do like that. And so I think the white materia is what uh helps purify them and, and call them and then uh it's it's Aerith's prayers trying to sort of undo the damage and we see it sort of ripples yeah. through time. Um so it, it doesn't maybe line up with our version of, of events, but because the live stream takes on this kind of time out of joint, yeah. um, you know, property, we'll say, hmm. you know, that's, that's kind of the way that I've been. And I think uh, meteor it's weird. We see, like we see meteor kind of almost doing the opposite. Like it's, I, I, I do think that they have to have like the big meteor in the sky or oh. else people are going to be super mad. But I think meteor does like, I think that materia does more shit than oh, just, I, I think so too. Yeah. And I think that's definitely what we're going to, you know, kind of see. So, yeah, I, I like the idea of, um, of if, if the black materia is the ultimate destructive magic. Yeah then I like the idea of holy being the ultimate creative magic. Um, and that to me could be, who that could be a really interesting, um, I don't know. It could be an interesting battle between materia. It also strikes me and it, and it, Oh man. It also makes me wonder if, um, there is how do i say this it also makes me wonder cloud has this hollow materia at the end right he yeah. does yeah uh, he he has the hollow materia and the black and materia. he's got the black materia yeah. right 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 i'm curious what happens with that hollow materia and because we have the white materia at the bottom of the sea. We have the black materia now merged with the Buster Sword. But with this hollow, empty materia, I'm really curious if there is now this power. I, I wonder if it's possible for Cloud to fill that materia with one or the other based on agency choice and defiance of... Mm. I, I think that would be an interesting thing. I don't know how they would play it, but I, I think it'd be... Hmm. Interesting. This is what happens when you talk to me four days later. I'm just yeah. like, 
I'm just thinking through all these things. This is why I didn't speak for four years on remake. <laughs> <laughs> you know? He was like, what was it? Two months before Rebirth came out, I was like, I'm going to start making some videos on remake now. Okay. Let's see. Let's take some audience questions here. Okay. Are there audience questions? Guys, ask questions. There's plenty of you. Uh, why are people... Okay, here's one from Insightful uh, AU. Uh, why are people trusting that Sephiroth is actually telling the truth in that sequence? I'm assuming by that sequence, we mean... Do you mean that um, that he wants to extend the life of the planet, insightful AU, or do you mean the the th this is the nature of worlds mm. one? Mm. Um. Okay, I'll ask. I'll answer both. Okay, so the extend the life of the planet one is not is not just something that Sephiroth says. It's something that the Ultimania talks about in the um, the Materials Ultimania Plus uh, pretty regularly confirms that Aerith disagrees with the way that Sephiroth wants to extend the life of the planet. So it's clear that Sephiroth wants to extend the life of the planet canonically. What we can assume, though, is that he wants to do it in a very toxic horrible horrifying way like it probably by absorbing all of their souls or turning them all into mm -hmm. reunion cl clones he has very insecure attachment yeah. to things like i think he has a genuine want to have cloud as like a eternal rival or he wants cloud uh to unlock some potential in him or something like that it's clear that cloud is part of 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 his goal i, I think that's pretty clear so I don't think that he's telling, he's being uh, honest, but I don't think that he's saying something untrue. I think he's just, he's not telling the part of, of the truth that is the evil Sephiroth stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. As far as the nature of the worlds, once again, um, we, we do have at least the Ultimania saying that these are indeed worlds. Mm -hmm. And there is enough supporting evidence that these worlds ha are branched off because of Zack's decisions. Not only the visual language that we get, but the Ultimania does indeed confirm that. So that's a developer, not Sephiroth saying it. So I think the reason that we can trust that Sephiroth is saying true things is because he's saying true things when it benefits him to do so but we're not getting the things that are evil you know like we're not we're not su we're not suggesting that he wants to do any of this stuff for good reasons or that we know what his ultimate goal is or why we, he's mm. just giving us information that he thinks will help us he's telling cloud stuff that while true you know because he has all this stuff that shows him that it's true he's he's it's fodder for him to like build false conclusions from. Mm. So I think, I think Sephiroth lies plenty in the game, but I think he's stating true things and we know that they're true because of all of the supporting evidence, both in the game and that the developers have been like, Hey, this is a true thing. So that's mm. kind of why I personally believe him in those scenes do i think he's being deceptive like when he appears as you know tries to uh gaslight cloud into not trusting tifa of course of course you know but you'll notice he says true things when he's gaslighting he's like using his own memories mm -hmm. so i don't think he's necessarily like telling lies i think he's being deceptive so, okay, we got a bunch of other questions here. I, um, I kind of want to say something yeah. to that um, same effect. Sephiroth, <clears throat> Sephiroth is convinced of his plan, right? Yeah. And I don't, I'm not necessarily confident 
that his end game here is utter destruction and annihilation just for destruction and annihilation's sake. This is not like a Kefka situation here. Mm, yeah. Instead, I think that Sephiroth is trying... Um, I, I mean, we talk about Cloud's mental break. I, I think that we could talk about Sephiroth's here as well. Sephiroth is trying to mitigate the own painful dissonance in his own history. And how do you do that but creating other opportunities? You can't necessarily change who you are, but you can certainly live into... Um, if you create every other possibility, then you may be able to overcome that fate by having choice. And that's something that, that Sephiroth has not had. I'm not trying to, to um, make him a sympathetic villain here. Sure. But... In his mindset, it's like, the world is pain, the world is disappointment, let's destroy it and make it anew together. Mm. And for Cloud, it kind of is this idea of, okay, you have pain, but you're not reckoning with it. I'm going to remind you of it, so that then you'll join me and we can remake a world where there is no need for this kind of escapist right. dissociation. And so let's create new options for ourselves. And that final push with, with killing Aerith, and I, I think that that's a really interesting piece of Aerith saving him from the full brunt of that so he isn't broken um, yet. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that we'll see that in, in part three, um, that full breaking. So that Sephiroth doesn't have to deceive. It's like, yeah, this is what I'm doing. You're just not ready to accept this yet, which I think is in some ways more sinister <laughs> yeah absolutely it's more sinister yeah. i think um i think that leads organically to dreadly medley's question which is will we get the water burial in part three one thousand percent do you think in the live stream sequence like the, the big <clears throat> mental break i don't think it's in the live stream sequence i think it's in the crater sequence i think that Ooh. Sephiroth is going to show him the truth of what he's been shielded from, either in his mind or because of Aerith. I think that it's going to be the dagger, and I think that's when she he's going to say, that didn't happen. That's, that is not the way it happened, and Tifa is going to say, it, it is, though. And that's going to be the breaking point for Cloud. He's like, I like no. that. I think it'd be amazing. That's a good. That's good timing for it. I really like mm, that. Oh, it's great timing for it. And yeah. then to see the redemption of that moment in the live stream, how the, how he's he is processing that. Because I think that th there's got to be two visits of it. All like the full unfettered reality that Cloud's been hi hidden, uh, hiding from. In some ways, you've got to experience that so you experience that initial pain. And then you have the reparation. And I think that's what the live stream sequence is going to be about. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, That'd be cool. Okay, Useless Hoarding says, We see Cloud give Aerith the white materia in the dream sleeping forest. When she dies, we only see it fall, hmm. we only see it fall in the cloud dream state surrounded by rainbows. Also, did this? it did not turn green like in the original. What do we think is going on here? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've looked at the editing of that scene a lot. Um, and... Uh, I'm not really ready to like kind of say that that uh that the that, that that's a dream sequence that we see it fall in. I feel like that might be Genova because it's that that particular sequence has the Genova filter on it. But mm. I think he's getting uncomfortable in a flash. So that's that's Sephiroth and Genova trying to inject the reality of what happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I read that the opposite way. Uh, the um, and in terms of the the rainbow thing, I don't think the rainbow sequence is necessarily like we're in a dream world. I think rainbows are too ubiquitous to like give mm. too much credit to. Um, the other thing is the greenness of the materia. I think what they're trying to do is instead of holy being green. I think they're trying to make Holy B uh, match the compilations sort of live stream black and white uh, mm. concept because in 1.0 of the game, in the non-patch version of the game, 
the materia is just straight up green. Um, hmm. And Odie, Odie uh, noticed that uh, replaying. And um, if you look at his his Twitter, he Odysseus has has that. Maybe if somebody in chat can pull it up, but okay. no pressure. But it's straight up green. So they made a choice to change wow. that from green to white. And I think this it has to do with live stream black and white, and um, you know these two like kind of chaos concepts. Yeah, well, I like that. Um, is Sephiroth an ancient? Is what we know from the past the truth? I think there's more likelihood of like any other person being an ancient than Sephiroth. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that actually. <laughs> yeah, and it's like it's hard to know. Like, are humans just like Cetra that like yeah, no. just hated the planet and then just like don't care, and so they became Uncetra? Or is there mm -hmm. like, and like, we know that Cetra are physi physiologically distinct enough that that Hojo needed to like catalog every part of a fauna, as creepy mm -hmm. as that is. Um, so who knows if that's like an idea of collective unconsciousness, where like mm -hmm. you make enough choices and then there's like a epigenetic disconnect from Cetrahood. Or if yeah. like they are distinct species or something like that. Um, who knows what that means? But we can say that like I don't think that there's gonna be any any like ancient blood in in Sephiroth, personally. I don't know. I could be yeah. wrong. I, I I wouldn't say so. <laughs> uh prof did you have any chance to go back and review the Cetra murals? Um, I, I looked at them, um, yeah. but I have not gone back and played through them, um, which is what I'm wanting to do. I just haven't had time to, but eager. I did notice the, the robed figures there, and that, that's something that I haven't quite made out yet. Um, but I, I was like, one of the questions for me was, why is why are all of these, quote, clones immediately donning this dark black robe? And I think that that might be answered through the, some of the murals. That was an initial thought, but I haven't thought much about it. Yeah. So I do think that I, you know, after looking at the murals, I really think that the, the robes mm -hmm. are a perversion of, of the Cetra ideal for a couple of reasons. One, they look just like the Cetra robes on that mural. And that's supposed mm -hmm. to be the mm -hmm. Cetra, you know, fighting and then fighting for Genova. Yeah. Um, Two, the symbol on the back. So mm. that weird ass symbol. Yeah. Um, it's seven strokes. And um uh mm. there's a a guy on the live stream that um uh Pierce Arner, ex soldier, who wrote a really good article that that makes me really convinced this is true. What that is is that's a perversion of the original OG logo. If you go oh. play Final Fantasy Seven, there's this weird seven stroke line it plays it's just the logo and i think that's a perversion to look like on more, the title screen right yeah on the title screen yeah i think it's a pervert it's the it's same rich, seven yeah. lines reshaped to be oh genova-esque yeah and so i think i remember that, that symbol about yeah. that oh man yeah nothing's been said about it and so i think that is that is an indication that um this is like genova's warp of that symbol mm. And I think that that symbol is like something maybe archaic to the Cetra. Um, so that's oh that's kind of that's kind of where my head's been at. That's pure headcanon. Um, what do you think the Harbingers in universe purpose was now that you finished Rebirth? And um, so like in other words, how has it changed? Because he's been here the whole time, so he knows what your initial thoughts on the whispers were. Yeah. But how how has it changed now? Yeah, yeah, I, I do think that it is a um, a pushing of a different kind of providence at this point, um, and so I, I I I'm not completely stepping away from that original idea of predestination, um, providence, and governance. I really do think that this is a, a secondary um, invading providence and governance that's coming in, and that's what's happening. Here, it's a destruction of um, 
and a manipulation of that foreknowledge of the planet. That's what I'm I'm thinking. So those harbingers, um, it, it's 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 interesting. I honestly, I was really thankful in chapter nine when we realized there was a distinction between whispers because some are good and some are bad, right? That to me was a narrative necessity <laughs> um, in order to really help understand because that was what was pretty confusing in the first one because the harbingers and the whispers in the uh in chapter 18 are just likened to every other whisper at that point and i don't think that that's necessarily the case um it almost makes me wonder are we going to get like different colored um headlamps on all the whispers in a patch <laughs> for a remake <laughs> but i don't think we will but i, I i'm glad that they did that here um, Marius Boss says, is the Black Materia uh, no longer the Temple of the Ancients like it was in the OG? Um, I, I mean, I think, I don't think that it, it, it it's like, literally is anymore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's right. I think it's, it's more that it's literally the key. Uh, yeah. And the reason that the the reason that there's this um, like the in the original, um, you know, there's this timekeeper and there's all this this extra lore to the to that temple yeah. that makes it really weird. And it's like, oh, well, and then it just becomes the, the black materia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was supposed to act as sort of a time capsule. We know that from like old Ultimanias, but like and yeah. that's the explanation for all the hieroglyphics and stuff like that. Well, this time they really made it that they really made it like, so this is, this is all a warning as to why this thing exists. This is a history of our people. So it's literally yep. a time capsule. Um, but the added meta narrative of all the different worlds has made it be something more, uh, meta. So it's just the key. And they say that, that, you know, Sephiroth, Sephiroth says it too. And, and so does Aerith. That it's just it unlocks its counterpart in the space between worlds. Mm. So, um, I still think it's a really interesting choice, though, to have the menu screen all be in this like Cetra space. Yeah, um, and it's I, I it, not having seen the Temple of the Ancients uh, before the game. I thought it was literally just in the Temple of the Ancients when you're in the menu screen. It's a mm. little different. It's a different enough. And there's enough, like, other Cetra shit throughout the world that it's kind of its own thing. But yeah. I think I think the concept of it is still strong. It's the same thing that the Rebirth menu has where it's, like, got those little, those tessellations. And what I think the tessellations are supposed to represent is memetics or memory. I think yeah. this is the same thing only built upon. That this is, you know, that the live stream is largely the memory of... The ancients, you know, the the mm -hmm. ancients sort of have the the history of the planet, and that all of the things that you do that can pause the game and give you power, all magic in the world, um, you know, from a meta perspective, are provided by the ancients. So I think it's less like there's a real story significance, and it's all just cool thematic memory stuff. Nothing that I think yeah. you can make, um, you know, predictions from anymore. That's my take. You're in the same boat. Yeah, um, I agree. Okay, while they come up with some more questions, I'm gonna ask. So, you're you're a believer, you know. You yeah. uh, you have a set of beliefs that uh, you know a lot of your uh, academic exploits have have helped uh, support and bolster. And given you language for and given you a vernacular for the meaning that you've made what parts what lessons and and meaning you know from the perspective of a believer um mm -hmm. were you able to gather from from rebirth specifically mm. rebirth not not as a whole i think we're gonna get tons of that stuff in part three but it, but in rebirth specifically So 
some of it we've already touched on, but yeah. I, I, I can make it a little bit more personal um, yes. here. Um, visiting each region and seeing how they made meaning of their world um, and each character and realizing how they have made meaning of their world, the things that they embrace as part of um, integrating their history and the things that they have ignored purposefully to help shield them from from outside um, dissonance. I think that that's the lesson that I, I like to take, and and that's something that when I inevitably do a lecture play on this, it, it'll have a tone of my sixteen deconstruction of religion lecture series, where it's we're all making meaning. And yet there's a subjectivity to the meaning making that we have, whether we are Bugenhagen refusing to mm. bring in mm. contradictory elements that don't frame our worldview, or whether we're using the divine as a bolstering of our own flames of resistance like Junon. I, I think that there's the, the stories that we find to be archetypal and legend worthy in our mythos, these are the things that we need to look at. In my own experience, um, and, and this is where I will get a moment of personal and mm -hmm. personal privilege, I suppose. Um, I um, had been religious throughout my middle and high school years um, in the Christian tradition, and to the point that I wanted to devote uh, my life to it uh, by being a, a pastor or a priest. And so I went into um, undergrad wanting to do uh, religious studies, and, and that was the, the course that I took. I was in my first and second semesters, and um, I think it was an intro to Old Testament, intro to New Testament. So uh, very Christian oriented, even with the language of Old Testament versus Hebrew Bible. Um, and I remember my professor was bringing in all kinds of things that um, just did not align with my Sunday school worldview. <laughs> As you can imagine, um, you know, the creation of sacred texts, um, source criticism, um, the the chronology of the making of the letters of Paul in the New Testament for a Christian ideology or the creation of the Gospels and the redactors and all, all that kind of stuff. So um, I had come from a tradition that essentially said that the the spirit of the divine had imparted its power into a person and like wrote through their arm okay very very like through them and so i remember i was having a real issue with this and um i was speaking to a mentor and um i was like i'm really struggling with this stuff um and i'll i'll, I'll do what i've always been taught you know I'm, I'm gonna just learn it for the test and then i'll believe what i want and he stopped me and um, to this day, like I, I'm kind of indebted to him. He said, Wade, do you, uh, and again, this is very Christian coded language. Mm -hmm. uh, please hear me. He said, do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life? And I, I said, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he said, you need to remember that because if something is true in the world, then do not shirk away from it because you may be running away from the one who is the truth. That opened up my mindset in an amazing way. So if something is true in the world, then look at it, cherish it, embrace it, and understand that it may be bigger than my worldview. As I'm playing through Rebirth, that's what I'm seeing. You know, I, I'm seeing a worldview based on Shinra. I'm seeing a worldview based on Cosmo Canyon to be announced um, Wutai. Right. And every element is, again, kind of like that jewel that you have to turn in the light. I'm not necessarily on a quest to be right. I'm on a quest to find meaning yeah. that is beneficial to the world around me, but also beneficial to me as well. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of close with with this the, because the, I've, I've actually mentioned this a couple times on stream because I thought it was really, really important. Um, the, the most famous uh, atheist, um, or maybe the most famous atheist, um, or cri criticizer of, uh, critic of religion, Richard Dawkins, um, in his, 
Yeah, in his book, the uh, the God Delusion. Right. There's um, which I I've read. Um, I I really enjoyed uh, my time with that book. The prologue to some of the more um, recent versions, I guess, in the last ten years. There's a Q and A, and somebody says to him, "You always go after the worst of religion, the um, Pat Robertsons and the Jerry Falwells and blah 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 blah." But you always neglect the Paul Tillichs and the Dietrich Bonhoeffers and listed off some others um, that I find meaningful in my faith. And uh, his response was, if the majority of religion was like the Paul Tillich, the Dietrich Bonhoeffers, and he listed off a few others, I would have written a different book and the world would be a better place. But instead, you have, and he listed off a number of really um, kind of negative um, exclusionary theologians. And he said, but because of that, this is the reality of what I'm having to write. Mm. And th that phrase has really stuck with me. And so I, I think that that's why I really love Final Fantasy as a series, because it does help you, help me, excuse me, take a look at belief systems and deities of the day and see, see how it subverts communities, gives a sense of emboldening to some communities, and then sometimes at the expense of others. So that's the thing that I've been working through for 175 hours. <laughs> that's also what I loved about Ginatak, because it's like, sometimes I can lionize the Setra and say, oh God, they're the, right. the this, they, they're the ones that got it, but at what cost and at whose expense? And that's yeah. what was so compelling to me about uh, the Gi. Um, because it, it puts some shade on the Cetra a little bit. Um, but again, it's like, okay, what is fact? What is fiction? What is helpful? And what is detrimental? So does that answer your question? So um, well. Fantastic okay. answer. Okay, my next question. What are you most <laughs> looking forward to in part three? What is And, and follow-up question. What is your wildest swing about something we might see in part three? My wildest swing. So the thing that I'm most excited about um, is the the full breakdown of Cloud. Um, this game, Rebirth, um, one critique that I, I have passingly heard, and again, I'm, I'm brand new to spoilers because I just unblocked everyone. Uh, two days ago, including you, my dear friend. I yes. was like, oh my gosh, yeah. you're finally back on my timeline. I was like, thank God, it feels first like First thing you see is a Zelmyra post. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first thing. I was like, oh, it's a homecoming. <laughs> like, <laughs> the way Sephiroth meant it. Um, but this game, Rebirth, one critique that I've heard is that it fumbles its most emotional moments. Um, whether that's Aerith, or whether that is Barrett. Um, and that, uh, Barrett's uh, dime sequence, for example. And I think that there's a reason for that, um, for all of it, from a storytelling sort of thing. Um, number one, um, sometimes you don't have the time to process grief um, because the next grief point is coming, like mm -hmm. with, with Barrett. You know, I think that that was actually a really well done, real sort of like, there's no time to process this because there's a there's an enemy at the, the gates. Mm -hmm. And it, it robs Barrett of that moment. In the same way, it kind of is robbing Cloud uh, and the, the audience, the viewer of these moments of grief. I think the thing I'm most excited about is the grief train that we're gonna be on in, in part three. I think that it's going to be grief after grief after grief, point of pain after point of pain, where Cloud is going to experience the death of his mom that we don't really get. We get glimpses, but we don't get the full weight of it. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sadness of seeing Tifa fall and being unable to, to help. Um, the sadness of being the one to throw Tifa into the live stream where Cloud is still kind of out of it when all of that's happening in, in chapter nine. And then finally coming to terms with the, that moment of grief of I did, 
I, I did almost kill Aerith. I couldn't save her, and then I had to bury her. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that's why the North Northern Crater sequence is is going to be so powerful to me, because I think we're going to revisit every one of those things. Um, I don't think it's simply enough like it was in the original to to create confusion that's a mental break i think it's got to be look at the reality of what you, uh, what despair has done like I, I mean it's that it's that meme i will bring you despair sephiroth is going to bring every instance of despair that cloud has shielded himself from in that northern crater and it's going to absolutely level him so that he willingly hands over the materia just to get the despair to stop uh, I mm. that's that critical breaking point is what I'm excited about. Wildest swing, and I, I know that some people w may be upset with me about this one, but um, I think that the live stream is the maybe deepest, most intimate moment. Um, well, uh, aside from the obvious one, um, between Cloud and Tifa, um, it's an emotional intimacy that is um meaningful as far as like she is helping rebuild her childhood friend slash love i think that the live stream sequence is going to include um elements of everyone um not just tifa though tifa will be his guide but Aerith, zach um Biggs, Jesse, Wedge, his mom, um, even maybe even other, other members of the party. Um, and, and so I think that the live stream sequence is going to be expanded to include um, not just those childhood memories, but every memory and a redemption of those things. That's maybe my wildest swing. I, I fully agree and I've uh, taken some heat for it. Um, yeah. A lot of people flat. people are protective of, of Cloud and Tifa in that moment. I get it. Yeah, I, I totally do. But it, it it seems from a narrative standpoint that they're really wanting to do that. Well, I, I mean, everything has been about relationships. Like it's and it's yeah. it, when we say our relationship with the characters, we mean uh, yeah. because Cloud is the POV character. And when you yes. when you build affinity and I'll, I say this every episode, when you build affinity, you can't build the affinity between Tifa and Aerith. You can build it between Cloud and Tifa and Cloud yeah. and Aerith. So it's your relationships with these characters that is being built into something, you know, and uh, being built into something that's meant to pay off. And I yeah. fully agree that, um, you know, the we'll get something hopefully that lands really well and is sublime and, yeah. uh, you know, recognizes that, you know, what Cloud's strength is is that is that he does cherish things that he's that he's yeah. happy and he he feels love and um, you know that's it, which oh yeah. man that that phrase and I I know that I used it in a meme the other day and <laughs> like it's because I've been thinking about that a lot for Ch Cloud at the end of Advent Children to say there's not a thing that I don't cherish. It's going to, it's going to have new resonance when we see the things that have kept Cloud from cherishing life that he's shielded himself from. And so, like, I, I'm connecting that to the Northern Crater and, and even to the trials where Aerith is saying, the things that have made us, there's a way moving forward where we don't condone them, we don't like them, but we can cherish them for the moment of defying fate that we are in right now. And that, that I think is the new story that they're telling using the old compilation, right. which I think would be amazing. Um, um, and I, I, again, I, I don't know how they're gonna do that, but I, I think that's where we're going. I agree. And um, I think that's actually a really good segment to end on, which is that, mm. uh, you know, the, the, Maybe the delivery of uh, "There's nothing I don't cherish" uh, was was a little jarring, but it really was the the core of the original arc. It was really was yeah. the crux of the story. Is that um, yeah. it, inside of who Cloud thought he needed to be, which was yeah. you know this tough guy, aloof soldier, um, very shy, socially awkward, uh, is is somebody that just 
has unconditional concern for everybody and that wellspring of that is what he chose to respond to trauma with uh you, is is that yes and yeah. that's like that's what i think maybe i'm most excited about with all of this in that final confrontation in the crater in part three there's a line that cloud says that's super cheesy in the original but i think it's going to be powerful where he says we've come to tell you our memories mm -hmm. and this is a moment where he's it's really going to be like you tried to accentuate the bad and the disappointment so that we can unmake the world into something different but i'm here to tell you that those things i've embraced them and i'm cherishing them because they've brought me here and this is the moment that matters so i'm here to yeah. tell you these memories and you can't erase those memories that's going to be oh my gosh i'm ready for that that's going to be a beautiful moment so me too well hey thank you so much for being here and thank you youtube sure. for tuning in um obviously i'll have all of wade's links prof noctis's links available in the video description please please check out his content and um i'm sure this won't be the last time i have you on probably have you on again soon probably have you in on all sorts of stuff so really yeah. appreciate you and uh really really uh it's it's been nice to get to know you as a friend too and i i think you're a wonderful dude and um just you know cannot sell a person harder than prof noctis so uh, uh man you're the best definitely check out his content and enroll at his university <laughs> yeah <laughs> etc so with, come on with that goodbye youtube we love you very much